Because we have a packed room, all seats can be filled, but there is no standing in the back or in the aisle. If you are standing and do not have a seat, uh, you need to go outside. We do have screens and, and we can, uh, you can see the agenda and hear the speakers outside. So I'm asking you to uh, find a seat or uh, move outside. Once again, if you're standing in the back, you're out of order. You need to leave the room. Good evening. So before we get started today, I have an important announcement. If you, wish, if you wish to speak on agenda item H1, the final environmental impact report for Point Loma High School whole site modernization athletic facilities upgrade project, and your name is not listed on the blue paper located at both entrances to the auditorium, and you have not already submitted a request for public testimony form, please complete the form and submit to Cheryl Ward, our board action officer now. Once item H1 is introduced, the board will no longer accept any more public testimony requests for that item. Again, if you want to speak to the Point Loma High School whole site modernization item, item H1, and you have not yet submitted your request, please do so now. I was told that I did not have to sign the blue sheet out there. Which blue sheet are you talking about? There's a sheet at each of the doors, and if you haven't done that, uh, you have until the item comes on the agenda to fill in a request. You have time to do that. Welcome. We will now hear the public testimony on non-agenda items. The testimony on non-agenda items is limited to a maximum of 15 minutes per topic. Public testimony speakers are limited to a maximum of three minutes per speaker, and depending upon the total number of speaker requests, the time may be reduced to two or one minute. We have uh, 30 timely requests with uh, eight late submissions. We will do the 30, and we will go until uh, 30 minutes is up, so we'll go until um, 5.50 with one minute each and we will be holding you to the time. The time limit for each speaker on non-agenda item will be determined based on the total number of speakers. Non-agenda public testimony is for only those topics not on today's agenda. If your topic is on the agenda, you will be called to speak when we get to that subject matter item. 
Each speaker will have one minute to address the board. Please remember, no deferral of time is allowed and the board asks that speakers focus their comments on the issues and not on the individuals. When you begin speaking, a yellow light will come on, meaning you have one minute. When your time is up, the red light will appear and a bell will ring. Please finish your sentence when your time is up and we will be holding a very firm to the time limit. So I will call 10 to 15 names at a time. If I call your name, please come down to the podium and be ready to speak in the order that I call you. So uh, related to restorative justice, Mario Valladolid, Valladolid, Amelia Roche, Linda Williams, Justin Darling, Sandra Rodriguez, Deborah Robin Meck, Stephen Lettberg, Plaid Felix, on computer intervention, Francine Maxwell, and number 10, Francine Soledo. Mario, please begin. Good afternoon, Superintendent, Cabinet, and Board of Trustees. We, the community and district, and members and staff, district staff and members of the uh, Peace Promotion Momentum team are here today to show that we are serious about creating a fully restorative district. Yesterday I had a meeting with Superintendent Cindy Martin, Chief of Staff, uh, Stacy Monroe, Communications Officer, Andrew Sharp, and Director of Youth Advocacy, Vernon Moore. In that meeting I was made aware of a RJ project that has been worked on by our Superintendent and Cabinet for six months now, which will be revealed to placement and appeals Felicia Singleton and Justin Darling, uh, NCRC, our uh, restorative justice consultant from our district this coming Thursday. <clears throat> we the community and district staff will look forward to seeing this project before it is finalized. We are here to make sure the district leadership today does not repeat the mistakes of the past. We do not want this to be another blueprint during the uh, Alan Burson days. It was an idea, it is an idea that has a lot of good and well intended potential, but it will be included, but does not include the stakeholders of the district, our parents, students, and uh, teachers, counselors, and et cetera, it'll be a mistake. We need you all to be on board. We need all of the board, the superintendent cabinet, to all be on board for us to be able to create a restorative district in our, in our city. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amelia. <laughs> Amelia, followed by Linda and Justine. Yes, thank you for your time and attention. My name is Amelia Roach. I've been a resident of San Diego for most of 18 years. Um, I have been volunteering uh, on the average 30 hours a week um, for the last four months at Correa Middle School offering restorative practices. This is something that I've been passionate about for years and have been very excited to hear that San Diego has embraced this idea and this possibility and what we need is consistent backing so that the resources that have been working really hard to bring this experience for the students and the teachers and every school in the district can actually do what we've come to do and flourish. The students want it every day. The teachers, they don't even know what this is. They're curious. They need the opportunity to have the experience of restorative practices in their classroom throughout the schools. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Linda, Justine, Sandra. Thank you. Hello, friends. Good to see you again. <laughs> I'm Linda Williams, retired from the district and now a community volunteer. And we celebrate the amazing restorative practices and justice successes at our pilot schools. We're so eager to work with you to make specific plans to spread and share those practices and skills district-wide. Take it up to scale with an integrative support systems approach, robustly funded and staffed for success in a program which will be second to none. How can we help meet the need to cover the bases with a systemic approach 
for tiers one, two, and three district-wide with special attention, please, to K through six. How can we help meet the need for the promised restorative toolkit, which will offer exemplary resources district-wide for teachers at all schools, all grades, to use ASAP? And I've handed you what I'm delighted to personally offer you. And in conclusion, we're looking forward to sowing the seeds together and harvesting. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Justine, Sandra, and Deborah. Hello, board and Hello. superintendent. Um, my name is Justine Darling, and I've been working with restorative practices in partnership with the district for the last two years. And um, I just wanted to say that I'm I'm really excited about the idea of a plan, and I know that you guys um, said you've been working on a plan. Very excited to see that and be in collaboration with you on that. Um, I've been working with this incredible group of district staff and community members that have so much expertise and are so excited to support this effort. Um, so I just want to really encourage us to draw on that community expertise that is here to support us and is just so incredibly excited that this is moving forward. And. Um, also, just wanted to highlight the incredible work that's been done this year and looking forward to next year. There have been over 400 staff and students trained this year and just wanting to continue that good work with your support. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> Sandra, Deborah, Steve, and Fred Felix. <clears throat> Go ahead. Oh, yeah, hi. Please. Um, good evening. My name is Sandra Rodriguez, and I'm the Peace Promotion Organizer at Mid City Can. Tonight, you've heard several PPMT members voice their support for sustainable restorative practices, so I'll leave all that messaging up to them. Um, what I'd like to do instead is tell you a little bit about this team. A week ago, I asked the team some simple questions and wrote down their response. I asked, What makes up this team, and who's in the room? And this is what they said. Mothers, fathers, community members, administrators, educators, students, writers, organizational partners, teachers, practitioners, advocates, actors, political leaders, clergy, engineers, scientists, artists, media reps, musicians, skaters, punk rockers, organizers, college students, law enforcement, county workers, supporters, collaborators, and friends. This was the contents of the room in just one meeting, so I urge San Diego Unified to consider the input and wisdom of this team and all its allies as it moves forward to become a restorative district. Because without community, there can be no restorative justice. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah, Steve, and Pled Felix. Thank you. Hi, my name is Deborah Robin Meck, and it's an honor and a privilege to be here to speak with you tonight and to be a part of this great team. I've worked for the juvenile court schools for 12 years, and we certainly did a lot there that's similar to what we're doing with restorative justice. I've had the privilege as well to be working for our district in special education for the past 17 years. And I want to say that when Superintendent Martin came and spoke about the soft skills, it was like music to my ears. And when you read the poem about the river, the National Equity Project, again, I knew that our leadership was taking us in the right direction. Restorative justice is the culmination of everything we've done well in education for the past 35 years. And we have an opportunity to be leaders not only in California, but in the nation. And that was proven to be true on Saturday's convening up in Los Angeles when leaders from Sacramento came and had people from Los Los Angeles and San Diego, and our representation was amazing. Thank you for the opportunity to continue this great work. Okay. Steve? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Steve Lutbeg. Until June of last year, I was the law instructor at the Crawford uh, High School Academy of Law. Uh, I've been retired. I've been a member of the Peace Promotion Team, as well as uh, Restorative Collaborative and uh, the Teen Court Volunteer at Crawford High School. Have with me Larissa Galena, who's one of my old students, a remarkable young lady who has spent the last two years working on restorative justice and a plan on how it can be implemented and how 
students can be involved in that process. We gave you a draft last year at this time, and also last year at this time, we offered an invitation for you to be uh, involved in a circle led by our students. We have another invitation here, and I hope that all of you will take uh, Larissa and her colleagues up on it and participate. These kids are accomplished, they're knowledgeable, they can lead and they should lead. And I hope that in any planning that you do, you look to these children. They're great. Fred Felix, Francine Maxwell, and then Francisca Salcedo. Not Pleas Felix, not yet. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Felix. Thank you. My name is Plaz W. Felix. I work for the Tariq Kamisa Foundation. And if it's okay, I'd like Ira Canada to pass along packages to you from our foundation. Tariq Kamisa Foundation is a San Diego nonprofit stopping youth violence through education, mentorship, restorative practice programs. Our mission is to transform violence prone, at risk youth into nonviolent achieving individuals and create safer schools. TKF formed in 1995 after the tragic death of a young San Diego State student, Tariq Kamisa, who was killed at the hands of my then 14 year old grandson, Tony Hicks. Tony's been since the 25 years to life in an adult prison. The miracle in this issue was that Mr. Kamisa, Tariq's father, forgave instantly. And his forgiveness created an opportunity for us to create the Tariq Kamisa Foundation. Those programs have been in schools here in San Diego for 21 years. We do class curriculum, restorative practice educational programs. We do peace clubs, student leadership service programs. We do mentoring, individualized student prevention programs. These programs, with your support and your interest and your encouragement should be in every middle school in this district. Please do what you can to support this, restore the practices in every school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Francine Maxwell and uh, Francisco Salero. Francine Maxwell, I'm requesting that the board consider before the 216 2016-2017 school year begins to declare Crawford High School um, in the state of emergency. The children are underrepresented, of course, in the AP courses and the facility, you guys already know. I had a very fabulous meeting with some exceptional geniuses that attend Crawford High School and they shared that the fact that their principal is hardly around. I want this uh, diocese, everyone on the diocese to consider, the principal institute, it's not support. Every time that you pull that principal away from his campus, he cannot see and have help and support so that he can see who's teaching AP classes. It's the wrong people teaching AP classes. So he needs to be able to cultivate his staff so that our children have the best staff so that they can join in the educational opportunities. We have declared um, other schools in a state of emergency. I urge you, before the end of this school year, that you deploy some of the top people from Normal Street, get them to Crawford to help with this state of emergency. Thank you, Francine. So, after Francisco Salad, uh, Salcedo, we'll have Michael Poltorek uh, with La Crosse, and then we have Matthew Kostrinsky, Kyle Rescone, Lisa Cooper, Veronica Esparza, Sylvia Alvarez, Julian Alarcon, Sabrina Hanling, Eddie's. Gio, Gile, and Lauren Ariega. Uh, so, Francisca is once. Francisca Salcedo twice. Three times. Michael? Good evening, my name is Michael Poltrak. I'm a parent at Patrick Henry High School, and I'd like to advocate that lacrosse should be a funded sport. Uh, first, let me speak to the growth of la lacrosse. Um, and if you're here supporting lacrosse, please stand so you can be recognized. More than 800,000 players participate in the game of, of lacrosse across the country. According to the 2014 NCAA report, lacrosse was by far the fastest growing sport in the U.S. Women's growth was up by 109%, men's 95%. The probability of high school athletes playing in college, a high school lacrosse player is more likely to play their sport at college than any other sport. 
Uh, the one exception is girls ice hockey. We, we don't really do that here. Um, both girls and boys are three times more likely to play lacrosse than basketball at the college level. Opportunities for scholarship. As reported by scholarshipstats.com, as of 2014, there were roughly 14,000 men's scholarships. Finish your statement. Wow. Um, your, or your, your sentence, yeah. And then you can submit a written report, but we need to move on. Okay. So what's your pitch? Um, that minute went very, very quickly. Uh, opportunities for scholarship, quality schools in every neighborhood, uh, which would include providing for the scholarships for those those children in those under underprivileged right. schools, and well gender said. equality and <laughs> Title IX, and you'll be receiving my written report. So, Matthew. Uh, Kyle, Lisa, and Veronica. Good afternoon, board members and our student representative. My name is Matt Kostrinsky. I'm both a parent of Green Elementary School. I'm a first and fourth grader. Um, and I am a, a member of United Domestic Workers. It's a union for home care providers. Um, I'm here for about two points that I want to make out. As a parent, we teach our kids that they should always have an opportunity to address issues. We should always give them an opportunity to speak. And as a union member, we always fight for our members of home care when the social worker comes in to do an assessment on their client that a provider has the right to talk also. And what I'm here for today is the CSA members here. They should have a right when you're doing reclassification and talking about their work, they should have the same rights as everyone else has to speak about what they do and what they need and their voice is being silenced and we need to give them back the voice because what lessons do we teach our own children? if we do not give them a voice? And what lessons do I teach my providers when we don't give them a voice? I ask the school district, please give these folks here in the room and the ones that can't be here a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Kyle, Lisa, then Veronica. Hello, my name is Kyle Rascone. I'm a uh, school bus driver for you since 1991 to present, and I'm the VP of Transportation for CSEA. Um, I'm here to talk about reclassifications in the Transportation Department. Since the layoffs over 10 years ago, we've had one, and that was our BOSs going to TOSs and receiving a 17% pay increase along with the reclassification. Since then, we've had one salary adjustment, and all the rest of our reclassifications have been denied. In the Scheduling Department, they uh, been given the duties of a supervisor to carry out and they are classified workers they are not part of the administrators union and so they've been doing those for over a year now they submitted their reclass it was denied they submitted their appeal it was denied they submitted their second appeal and it was denied and so they're still doing the duties it hasn't been put into their job description but yet now transportation is funding an additional transportation supervisor position in answer to this Where's the money coming from? Did the money, if the money was always there and the work is there, why are they doing it this way? Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, Veronica, then Silva. My name is Lisa Cooper and I'm here to speak on behalf of classified staff regarding respect. Classified employees are the heart and soul of our school district. We work tirelessly from the time we get to get in to the time we leave. We are here for our students, we're here for our parents and the community. We do our jobs and more. There's always more. I'm hopeful that the district reclassification work group will have a successful discussion and actually get the ball rolling and get things get these reclassification blah, reclassifications done the right way and in a timely manner. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. <laughs> Sylvia, Julian, and Sabrina. Hi, good evening, board members and Superintendent Martin. My name is Veronica Esparza, and I'm a senior high financial clerk. I want to begin by saying that it takes a lot of courage to stand up for what is right and for what we believe in, and for some of us, it takes more courage than others. Um, I stand here to tell you that we have been denied a job reclassification even after substantial proof was submitted to justify our request. I'm here to ask the board to please reevaluate the reclassification process and ensure it is being followed fairly and ethically. There are so many of us standing here before you and we can't all be wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Julian, Sabrina, and Eddie. Just, just checking. Hi, 
I'm back. Two well, weeks ago I was here speaking to the same thing you're going to be listening to for the next five, ten minutes maybe. Uh, last week was a wonderful celebration of classified employees. Uh, there was a lot of wonderful talk about his, how essential we are, how important we are, yet unfortunately we don't feel it. We don't get the feeling that we're important. It's a lot of talk, not a lot of action. I always tell my kids, I don't want to hear your talk. I want to see the walk. And that's what we're asking of the district. We're asking that you follow a process that is fair and it recognizes the work that we do, the extra work that we do. I can tell you, I've been working lots of extra hours because of things that have changed. I've been doing things that aren't in my job description, but I do them because I love my job, I love my school, I love my students. I would ask that you please direct the, this program, this HR program, to look at it at a more meaningful way and to respect us. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. <laughs> Sabrina, Eddie, and Lauren. No? S Sabrina, Hanlon. Oh, I was you, I'm sorry. Uh, Eddie and Lauren. Uh, what happened? Julian was here. Uh, then we have uh, next Jim Butcher, Tiffany Stumpf, Miguel Ariano, Lucia Pineda, Carrie Morgan, Carrie Morgan, June Bassa, Dale Kaylee Bankhead, Rosemary Eichmann, uh, then Citizen and Anna Bonatati, and that may be it. That's the last 10 on the, the others uh, we'll catch at the uh, end of the meeting. So uh, you are? My name's Jim Butcher. Okay. Jim? All right, my name's Jim Butcher. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate your time. Um, I've been a school district employee as an AC mechanic since uh, 2007 and uh, attempting to get my job classification done since 2011. Um, the process is, is extremely difficult and I would urge you to uh, revisit the actual process that you're making everyone go through to uh, prove our diligence and our job that we're doing. Um, uh, how about new ACs are uh, getting installed all over the district and they're going to get, they're going to need to be maintained. We're making an effort, we're hiring more staff, but the technology side is what I'd like to speak to. The training is there, our supervisors are urging us to get training, and we're fulfilling the request. However, HR refuses to acknowledge that our job has evolved at all. Um, as far as I'm concerned, being pushed by the Green Initiative, using the latest technology and very large systems such as the system implemented here, we need to get recognized. We need the respect, and I would like some sort of maybe a professional panel from the outside, a consultant to come in because it's very difficult to get a very technical trade across to a panel of people that are involved in the trade. You got it. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Tiffany, Miguel, and yeah. Lucia. You called me, then you let me, left me out, Dr. McQuarrie. I did? <laughs> My name is Sylvia Alvarez. I'm chapter president for OTBS CSEA 788. I did So in the past, the, the reclassification process had dedicated staff members who conducted legitimate interviews and treated classified employees with the respect they deserve. Now the term we hear, I'll say as an insult, is a classification is not a way to get uh, raise. So, w since we met last time, we have received a communication uh, suggesting another committee to work together, labor and uh, district. What you need to know is we've been there, and trust is broken, and um, we will come back to the table, but there's a lot of work to be done. You can't dismiss us. As uh, Lindsay Birmingham said, we're not second class citizens. So what I'm asking is that the district and direct HR to treat all, all employees and classified employees with the respect and dignity they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Tiffany or Miguel? Tiffany, Miguel, Lu uh, Lu Lucia, and Carrie. Tiffany wants. Tiffany is here. Thank you. 
Hi, thank you for letting me speak. Sure. My name is Tiffany Stumpf. I'm a high school school to work transition assistant. I've been with the district for 10 years and on behalf of the other high school school to career case, or excuse me, SWTAs, um, we recently, last year, submitted our reclassification. It was denied. We submitted our first appeal. It was denied. It was denied. The executive director said we were denied because our position is centered on assisting school to career case managers and resource teachers. We don't assist anyone. Her statement is false. High school SDPTAs are the ones who coordinate the work internships at the program. We manage the caseloads. We are doing what vocational rehabilitation counselors that were accessed over four years ago do all by ourselves. It is time for San Diego Unified School District to notice and acknowledge that many classified staff jobs have evolved and increased over time. The reclassifications for high school SWTAs and many other reclass reclasses need to be taken a look at by our superintendent to ensure that classifications are conducted fairly and that justice is finally served for classified workers. Thank you. Thank you. Miguel Arellano, followed by Lucia Pineda. Pineda. Hello board, um, my name is Miguel Larellano and I will make my statement brief. Please respect the classified workers by respecting the, process, the reclassification process and actually observe us doing what we do. Shadow us, respect us, and respect the process. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, Superintendent Martin and members of the board. My name is Lucia Pineda, and I'm the senior high financial clerk at Patrick Henry High School. I would like to speak to you today about the San Diego Unified School District Senior High Financial Clerk's Appeal for Job Reclassification. Recently, we submitted our original request for job reclassification, which was regrettably, and we believe unjustly, denied by human resources, despite our having provided a great deal of evidence in our favor. Not only did human resources see fit to dismiss the validity of our stance, but they neglected our right to the deserved due process as well. No real effort was made to consider our evidence and the points being with it. My career as a senior high financial clerk began in 1998, and indeed, since then I have seen a vast increment in our responsibilities without the necessary additions being made to our job description as well as our compensation. This is unfair to all presently working in this position as well as those who might cultivate a career in this field in the future. There is at present a unique opportunity posed before this board to do what is right and fully consider this appeal. This is an opportunity to stand for fairness, to be truthful and honest in regards to our job description, and I stand before you today respectfully asking you to take this opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. My name is Jane Bowser. I'm the first vice president of the Paraeducator, Chapter 759. We, classified employee, has always been told that we are important part of this educational process. Every year they recognize us, they tell us all how important we are, but at the same time, it's all words. It's an empty words that being says there, being recognized, nothing is happening. Respect, you hear all these people that come with the re reclassification. Since many years ago, they cut, they cut employee, they cut, they cut the position, they cut the hours. The job is still there, and then it's just been distributed and filed in other employee that is working in the site or in the offices. So we talk about recognition, recognize us and respect us by doing the right thing to look at the re -re reclassification for this district. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Hey, Carrie Morgan. Hi, Carrie. 
Mr. President, Trustee, Superintendent Martin, uh, Dale Kelly Bankhead, I'm here this evening on behalf of these key members of your educational team, the classified employees represented by CESEA, as well as the 200,000 working um, families that are members of the San Diego Imperial County Labor's Council, of which I'm Secretary Treasurer. I know that this is a district that teaches kids and staff that the the model for resolving a disagreement is informed, respectful, and fair uh, interaction. And as you've heard tonight, your employees, your key team members, do not feel that that's what's happening right now. The process is falling far short. I'm here to urge you to demonstrate your leadership and make this process one that reflects the respect that I am convinced that you show for, hold for these workers, but please show it through this process. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Dale Kelly. Rosemary, and then we will have uh, Citizen and Anna. Um, Dale Cayley, going once? Yeah, just about. Oh, she did speak, okay. Uh, Rosemary? And then we'll have Citizen. National attention to the sexual assault issues in San Diego Unified has not been enough for this board to take a public position of the need to do more to protect children. Teacher misconduct continues due to Martin's failure to address the culture of secrecy that predominates this district. On March 7, Esther Warkov, Executive Director of Stop Sexual Assault in Schools, sent a letter to the superintendent and board members calling, on the, district's calling the district's response to the complaint that sparked the federal investigation as deeply disturbing. Nothing from the superintendent. Silence. Not even the courtesy of a response. And certainly no press conference declaring that Martin is going to address this problem. The current practice of just paying out lawsuit settlements to children that have been harmed um, is a sad commentary on this superintendent and this school board. Until the school board takes concrete action, children will continue to suffer sexual assault. Imagine my surprise when I opened up the news in San Diego and I find out that there's a teacher looking at a website like this and another teacher being arrested for sexual molestation. You have a problem and you need to address it. Thank you, citizen. Anna? Hi, I'm Anna Bonatati. I'm a teacher in San Diego Unified, and I've spoken to you before about the rights of ELs. Um, I'm really concerned about the new arrival center. I watched the news program it was an article on TV last week, and they were talking about how the new arrival center would now have expert teachers that would push in and assist these students, except the expert teachers that they have all lost their jobs because they've been accessed because they don't have the correct credential to teach English, which is a single subject with a single subject, which you do not need to teach ESL. They want that for the public speaking class, but the students will not have the linguistic abilities to meet the standards of a public speaking class because they don't get to that level if you look at the California ELD standards until they are in an exiting, expanding level. So I don't understand. If your concern is really about language acquisition, why not put teachers that have an ELD certificate? Um, credential to teach, or teachers that have advanced degrees in ESL, or teachers that have been doing it for years, but someone who hasn't, it, it's, about, it's about A to G requirements. That's what that's about. Thank you. So speakers, uh, we don't have time for, uh, uh, at, the, at, at the initial public no agenda comment will be held till the end of the meeting. Those include Mary Dan Herter, Lee Moore, Jack Lacero, Mary Lou Finley, uh, Wanda Reed Vindemar, and Ro Lighty. And Scott Ellum, thank you. 
So this completes the non-agenda public testimony for this portion of the meeting. If you did not get, if we did not get to you in the first 30 minutes, we will also hear non-agenda public testimony at the end of the meeting with those names uh, that I've, I've read. Thank you all for your comments and for taking time to address the board and the superintendent today. We appreciate your input and please know that your perspectives help us to better serve students, parents, and the community. Per the Brown Act, public testimony on non-agenda items is not a conversation or dialogue with the board. If an issue needs further attention, the board may refer the matter to the superintendent for review and or investigation. So, I would like to welcome everyone present today and those watching the broadcast and call the May 24th, 2016 regular meeting to order with all board members present. The Air Force JROT's color guard from Mira Mesa High School will now present the colors. Please stand for the presentation of the colors. If you wish to address the board today on any of the items before the board today and your name is not on the speaker list present, printed on the blue paper located at both entrances to the auditorium and you have not yet already submitted a request for public testimony, please complete the form and submit to Cheryl Ward, Board Action Officer. Speakers on agenda items will be called on to speak during the discussion of the agenda item. Once discussion begins on an item, no additional public speaker request will be accepted by the board. Board bylaw 1025 provides that public testimony on agenda items is limited to a maximum of 20 minutes per consent and or action item, allowing for a maximum of 10 minutes per opposing viewpoint. Public testimony speakers are limited to a maximum of three minutes per speaker, depending upon the total number of speaker requests received by the board on an item. The item may reduce to two or one minute each. The time limit for speakers on today's agendas, items will be announced at, the, at each item. Non-agenda item testimony was heard at five o'clock and will also be heard at the end of the meeting. We will now hear from from item B3, the student presentation from Cabrillo Elementary School. The students will present on their Leader In Me program and will provide an instrumental and vocal performance. Please welcome Principal Irene Hightower, Teacher Carmen Allo, and their students. There's no seat. Well.
Good afternoon, Superintendent Martin, board members, ladies and gentlemen. We are students of Cabrillo Elementary. My name is Aiden Newbern, a fourth grader in Mr. Furley's class. We are here today to share with you The Leader in Me, a program where we learn and practice the seven habits of happy kids that our principal, Ms. Hightower, introduced to us last year. The seven habits teach us leadership and help us not only be better students, but better citizens in our world. Each of us will introduce a habit that Ms. Oler's TK and kindergarten class will share a short song they wrote and practiced for your entertainment. We know our habits will take us far in all aspects of our life. We will begin with habit one. Hello, my name is Hannah Ledoux. I am a student at Cabrillo Elementary School. I will be speaking of, about my favorite habit, habit number one, to be proactive. Habit one is to control the situation by making things happen or by preparing for possible future problems. I recently had a project due and part of my responsibility was to write a paper. I didn't write the paper and the consequence of that was I only got half the credit and I didn't get recess until I had turned it in. I, had I been proactive, I would have gotten all my credit and I would not have to miss my recess. <laughs> being proactive is important. Examples of me being proactive include cleaning my room even when I wasn't told, helping a friend when she was hurt, and once I got lost and I stayed put where I was so my mom could find me. <laughs> being proactive has made me lots of friends and has made my mom proud. <laughs> school. I will be speaking about habit two, begin with the end in mind, have a plan. I plan ahead and set goals for myself. I'm prepared at all times. I think about the choices I make now will affect my future. I think about the positive or negative consequences of my actions before I act. Habit number two is about planning and seeing what your plan is. Being prepared at all times is important. For example, if you have a field trip and you are not prepared, then you are not ready to go anywhere. <laughs> Thinking about the choices that you do now that could affect your future is good because if you make your choices be good, then it could help your future. The last one is very important because thinking the positive or negative consequences of your actions before you act is the best thing you can do for habit number two. One day at the park, I wanted to make sure that a lot of students were using at least one habit. My plan was to teach the students who chose habit number two what it was all about. I taught them all the meanings of habit number two. That made me feel proud of myself because helping other students with the seven habits makes me feel happy. So good luck on habit number two. <laughs> Tyler S. McCord and I will be talking about habit number three, putting first things first. This means spending time on things that are important to do. This means that I say no to things I know I shouldn't do. It means setting priorities, making a schedule, and following my plan. It also means being disciplined and organized. In my life, an example of putting first things first was when my second grade teacher gave me an assignment to draw an overhead view of my city. At first I thought it was impossible, but I wasted no time. 
I checked Google Earth for an overhead view of San Diego instead of watching movies. When I finished, I rewarded myself with a weekend of relaxation. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me introduce putting first things first. and I am a third grade student from Carpeo Elementary. I will be explaining habit four, think win-win. To me, think win-win means to help others solve problems, to share things so everyone gets something and no one gets nothing. An example of how to use think win-win is getting my homework done. If I get my homework done, my teacher is happy because I did my work and I did something with my learning. And I am happy because I get a good grade. I'll, we both win something if I do my homework. Also, my principal is happy and my parents are too. Another example is being on the playground. I like to be on the monkey bars. Sometimes I get there and Ari does at the same time. In order to solve our problem, we can take turns going first or do rock, paper, scissors to choose who goes first. We both get to go, so it's a win-win for both of us. And now Miss Ola's class will sing a song for us. telling you about habit number five. Seek first to understand and to be understood. Have you ever interrupted someone? Do you know how that can make them feel? Instead, do you try to see other people's viewpoints? Look at them in their eyes when they are trying to talk to you. To me, that is what it means to seek first to understand and to be understood. I used to get angry at my little brother when he made a mess with his toys. I could have told on him to get him in trouble but instead I talked to him and tried to make him understand and now he puts his toys away without even being asked. Because I saw first to understand my brother we didn't fight or get in trouble with our parents and now he understands that picking up his toys is important. Diego De Leon, and I'll be telling you what it means to synergize, habit number six. To synergize means to work together to solve problems. Don't be greedy. Share with others. Work together to make people feel better. Be humble. You don't always have to have the right answer. I use habit number six by sharing with others. I'm also humble with other people. I see when peop people want to do something that I'm doing. Last week during science, we were studying about light, ocean life and we had fish in our classroom. Our team had to collect information about water temperature, food habits, water cleanliness, and other things about our fish and their habitat. 
Our team had to work together to gather all this information so we could get done quickly and get our information into Mr. Farley on time. Our team had to synergize to get everything done. Our team found out it's better to work together instead of wasting time and each doing our own thing. Gibbons. I'm a student at Cabrillo Elementary. I've been there for about four years, but in third grade, my teacher, Mr. Cooperman, showed me something amazing, the seven habits. These habits are the reason that I wrote this speech. So now I'm very proud to present Sharpen the Saw. By achieving balance, sharpening the saw, you won't feel empty inside. You achieve balance by not doing the same things over and over. Also, you should eat, exercise, and sleep well. Lastly, you should strive to be a better person. Otherwise, repetition leads to being bored and unhealthy. What does sharpen the saw mean to me? When I do the same things, I feel like my life doesn't have any flavor, and I feel like a robot. If I don't play with my friends, I feel left out and sad. On the other hand, I feel refreshed when I eat many things. For example, I have everything on my burger, and I try all the different veggies my mom eats. I try to make myself a better person by helping people things I'm good at and they struggle at, going to church and being a Boy Scout. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Irene Hightower. I'm the principal at Cabrillo Elementary School. The nine schools in the Point Loma Cluster have dedicated ourselves to teaching students the virtues of the seven habits in one form or another. So when students enter Point Loma High School, um, they are all... <laughs> They are all familiar with what is known there as the Pointer Way. As you saw today, our students def definitely show a sense of agency and leadership that will prepare them to be college and career ready for our TK students here. That will be the year 2029. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed listening to the work we've been doing and what we've been up to at Cabrillo and invite you to come and visit us sometime soon. Thank you very much. Embedded or sort of? Is that embedded or sort of? Yes. Yes. <laughs>
So what an incredible example of embedding our restorative practices, civics learning, music, the arts into the curriculum, and articulating our our programs from elementary through the middle school into high school. I want to thank the uh, Point Loma Cluster for an outstanding performance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I would like a motion to adopt today's agenda with section I, superintendent consent agenda, to be considered the So following. moved. Second. Has been moved and seconded. Does any board member wish to remove any items? Seeing none. Um, no. We have a speaker no. on consent. Let's move to all in favor. Cast your vote. Are we ready? Cast your vote. We consent. Adopt the agenda, please. We adopted the agenda. Um, President McQuarrie. I did. I'm green. <laughs> All right, now we're on item I. Oh, so we adopted the agenda, thanks. We have speakers on consent items I-19, I-26, I-27, which will be heard at the end of the meeting. Do we have speakers on any other consent items? No. Okay. Actions on section I, superintendent's consent agenda, means that all items appearing in section I are adopted by one single motion unless a member of the board or the superintendent requests that any item be removed from the consent agenda and voted upon separately or withdrawn from today's agenda. Generally, consent agenda items are matters which members of the board and the superintendent concur are routine in nature and should be acted on in one motion. In addition to item 1.3, I3, I10, and I35, which were previously removed by the staff, and I19, I26, and I27, Ms. Ward, are there any other changes to the consent agenda? No, there are not. I'd like a motion, which we already have. I would like a vote to approve the consent agenda as revised. Please vote. I'll move the uh, consent uh, agenda as stated. Second. Now we have a vote. All right, now vote. Unanimous. Are there any reportable actions to report out from the closed session at this time, Ms. Donovan? She's stepped out of the off, uh, out of the okay. room, but there are no reportable actions today. All right, thank you, <laughs> Superintendent Martin. Are there any administrative assignments to report out? No, President McQuarrie. There are no administrative assignments to report this evening. Right along. At this time, I'd like the ASB student representative to the board to introduce mm -hmm. themselves. Please tell us about yourself and what is going on at your school, both academically and socially. Tim Pem. Uh, ASB President Mira Mesa High School and Owen Lem, ASB President Sarah High School. And Owen, in addition to your school report, please provide the ASB Council President report. And let's hear first from Tim. From Pham. Hi, my name is Timothy Pham, but there's a correction. I'm actually from University City High School. Ah. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, a wrestler and a dancer. And. Um, I'm going to San Diego State next year. So we have. <laughs> so on Thursday, we're having a thing we call Red Nose Day. That's when we uh, all wear red noses and um, we take a picture and we hashtag on Twitter, Red Nose for Kids. And the Gates Foundation is donating $10 for that, like per red nose. Um, we have our pep rally coming up on the 3rd. Our prom is coming up the following day on the 4th. And we're just waiting on senior activities. Thank you. Excellent Thank report. You. I was also a wrestler. Oh. All right. Ready? All right. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name's Owen Lim. I'm the Sarah ASU president and then the president of the President's Council here. Um, it's Sarah. We j This last Friday, we had our talent show, um, and that gr drew um, record crowds, I think, because um, um, a big factor of that was we had um, Avalon Young, who is a Sarah alumni. She graduated, I think, 2012, and then she, on the most recent um, season of American Idol, made it to the top eight in the finals, so it was nice to have her back for that. 
Other things we have going on at Sarah, our student versus our, so our senior versus staff basketball game is this Thursday, and then our prom is coming up on June 11th. Um, things for the council we have, uh, we just this Saturday we had our ASB bonding day where um, students from all over the district and ASVs are invited to come together at our school, um, hang out. We have some athletic events going on, and then we have some things where you try and share ideas with each other to try and take back and benefit your, to your own school. We had uh, just a little over 100 people there. I think we had people from seven or eight schools show up, so that was nice to get all those people there, and hopefully they can all bring things back to benefit their own schools. And then just a couple personal things about me. Um, I just finished up volleyball and swim for this sports season and then I'm headed off to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo next fall. Awesome. Thanks. Excellent. Um, Superintendent Martin, please share your information report. Thank you, President Macquarie. Um, I know Trustee Whitehurst Payne and Dr. Macquarie will probably talk about our visit to Sacramento on Thursday, so I won't spend too much time on that, but we did have, along with our CFO, Jenny Salkeld, went to Sacramento last week to do budget advocacy and talk about the great work that's happening in our district and also about casting a vision for what needs to continue to happen for our schools. So we met with the Department of Finance, Legislative Analysts Off, as with the Assembly and the Legislature. So we were very happy to be able to talk about um, what our goals are and how Sacramento can help us reach those goals. Um, in addition to that, and I know you'll say more about that work, in addition to that, everybody knows how committed San Diego Unified and this board is to conservation and protecting the future of our planet. We speak about that very much. I talked about some of the key initiatives that we have in place. and so. Part of what we have in place is half of our schools have native organic gardens. Half of our elementary schools have green teams, which focus on recycling, conservation projects at their sites. There's too many projects and programs to go into now, but I just wanted to highlight something very special specifically that happened last week in this regard. May 20th, some of you may know, was Endangered Species Day, and we celebrated on that day at the Wild Animal Park with our very strong partnership with Kids Eco Club and the Discovery Education Foundation. So I want to honor some of our teachers for their efforts to engage our students in saving endangered species and for their efforts to engage students in conservation science. Lynn Howard from from Encanto. If you're here, please stand up, Lynn Howard. <laughs> With their elephant posters. Emma Lynn Leopard from Montgomery Middle School. Emma Lynn. Tim Bingham from Kearney High School. Laura Dickens from Patrick Henry High School. Yeah. We also had Anthony Palam Palamoto from Point Loma High School. He can't be here tonight, but he's also one of our leaders and visionary teachers. This work around conservation and saving our planet um, is a district-wide systemic effort led by this board, but it's really in the heart of our teachers and in the classrooms and you teachers that I just introduced are fine examples of accomplishing that mission in, in partnership with our Kids Eco Club. I also need to honor some of our outstanding students who help carry this message. Brooklyn Joy, are you here? Our fifth grader from Longfellow. And especially Max Gwynn, Max if you please stand up, the founder of Kids Eco Club. This all started when Max six years ago had this idea of involving and engaging students in being active and being proactive. And his vision has more but realized itself with over 100,000 San Diego K-12 students participating in Kids Eco Club's activities annually, with the majority of them coming from San Diego Unified. If you want to see the real concrete actions that kids are taking because of Kids Eco Club, go to their website, kidsecoclub.org slash take action. This is about action and making our world and our planet a better place place and we know that our goal as a district is to create students who are actively literate, contributing, participating members of their community who make a positive difference in the world and it's the partnership with Kids Eco Club and Max embodying the spirit and the mission of this district that I just want to make part of my report tonight. Thank you Kids Eco Club and Max and our teachers and our students for leading this effort. You are the change makers and the visionary and I know as I was speaking the pictures of what we're accomplishing have been rolling so thank you for everything you do on behalf of this board and the superintendent. Thank you.
Board members will now have the opportunity to speak and share information if they wish. So, Trustee Thank you. Sharon whitehurst Bank. First of all, good evening to everyone. It's after six this evening. Good evening to everyone. And I would like to say that on last Thursday, uh, Dr. Mike, uh, the superintendent and the um, financial officer and I went up to Sacramento and we met with uh, a plethora of people and uh, we discussed our financial issues and gave them information and they shared the state of affairs uh, with us from the state's perspective and that was a very productive meeting. We also uh, met with a couple of senators, um, Senator Marty Block, and as well as Ben Weso. We saw them there on the floor of the Senate as they discussed the gun uh, issue and the fact that we needed some restrictions on guns. Uh, we also uh, watched the superintendent give a presentation on music and the need to bring music back into our schools at a greater level. And we know that for next year, our schools will uh, be enhanced and enriched with a better music program for all of our schools. And we want to thank the music department for their commitment to serve all of the schools, especially those in District E, and we're looking forward to that. In fact, the schools are, are beginning to make some preparation as to how they can make it more effective for all of the children at the schools. Um, I, I visited several schools during the last couple of weeks, but I just want to say that uh, in terms of my pet school, and maybe that's the wrong term, but everybody knows that Crawford is my, my school that I really focus on, and on last Friday, uh, Dr. Mike and I went out and visited the school. And uh, after discussing it with the superintendent today, I think we will see some uh, additional actions occurring at that site. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, and then I visited Carver and uh, we'll take a look at some things there also. But I want to say, having said that about Crawford, I, my focus has been on the facility because we need to do some things there. The students are doing a tremendous job there. And I think we saw evidence of the students really being engaged there. Uh, I read a document which said that that is the most diverse school in the state of California, uh, which is amazing uh, that out of all the schools in the state, that is the most diverse high school in the state of California. So uh, we know that there are some things that we are working on and I look forward to seeing the fruit of that, the uh, results from that. And I just want to say that today, Morse High School had an open house for 200 elementary schools, uh, school children, and they were there visiting the school. And I guess as a result of that, some of them have said, I wanna go to that school now. So uh, it was a good thing that the principal and the staff there as well as the students, opened up to have an open house for elementary children so that they could get to see uh, the various programs, the wonderful programs they have there at Morris High School. So we're looking forward to the result of that. They had uh, students from Audubon and uh, from even one of the charter schools to uh, visit the school and other students from Penn. So um, thank you for this opportunity to share. And uh, we'll let you continue. Trustee John Lee Evans. No? Trustee Vice President Barrera. Yeah, very quickly, we had a great event at uh, Chavez Elementary School last week. The uh, students at uh, Chavez uh, have been working uh, not only with their own teachers, but with the uh, Rainforest Art Project that's actually worked on several uh, murals and art pieces throughout our district and other schools. Uh, around uh, San Diego County, uh, they've been working on a on a mosaic, um, which is a large portrait of Cesar Chavez, the namesake of the school, that they plan to hang up in a 
prominent area of the of the school uh, soon, and we're going to actually ask the students to come here to the board and uh, show us their uh, their their work of art. But it's it's been a, a terrific project. We had uh, Barbara Ibarra, who's the uh, granddaughter of Cesar Chavez, who came uh, to look at their uh, look at their work. And so, um, you know, we thank Francisco Santos and the and the staff at uh, at Chavez for the work that they're doing with their students. Yeah, so moving from left to right, <laughs> Trustee Weiser. Okay, thank you, President McQuarrie. Um, a couple of things to report out. Uh, first of all, I was thrilled to attend the Patrick Henry High School annual Lacrosse Girls Award Ceremony, which is the highlight of the season. And there, at Patrick Henry High School, there are f uh, 53 students that participate in lacrosse there. It was a great uh, banquet celebrating the work of so many of those uh, girls in athletics. The parents were there, the boosters were there, the coaches were there. Uh, it was really a great program. And uh, I, I think that by me being there, it helped me to realize how important it is uh, that, you know, that we allow this kind of an opportunity for all of our schools, not just some of our schools. Uh, and also I thought it was uh, really interesting. I was talking to a parent who had said, isn't it interesting that in San Diego we fund sports for boys, like football, but we ignore the funding needs for athletics for girls, like girls lacrosse. And so I, th I thought, you know, that parent was uh, raised a very good point. And so I was really glad that I was able to attend the awards uh, uh, event at, for Patrick Henry High School. The second uh, event that I attended that I think is equally important because it feeds into a lot of the social justice issues, I attended an event to support an initiative uh, that is trying to get at the root of institutionalized racism in our society. And I was thrilled to meet somebody who I grew up with watching on television, Mike Farrell from MASH. Um, he was very outspoken in support of replacing the death penalty in California with life in prison without parole. And if that does happen, it would save taxpayers in the state of California alone $150 million a year if we did that. And that's money that could be very well spent in public education instead of incarceration. Um, the, um, the third event that is an annual pilgrimage for me and a lot of my friends is out at the park, which a lot of other people in the public probably uh, have learned about, uh, Gay Day at the, pa uh, at the Padres, uh, Peco Park, where we were thrilled to watch the San Diego Padres defeat the LA Dodgers in the 11th inning. Um, so that was, that was a great event. And maybe you've heard, it's, I, I believe it's on international news now, that there was a mistake, uh, that the San Diego Gay Men's Chorus was to sing the national anthem. And I was there. And the, the, the tape that was played, unfortunately, uh, was the voice of a female that did not allow us to hear the chorus sing, or, uh, and then they were promptly escorted afterwards. It's my understanding that there is a meeting with the director of the Gay Men's Chorus, uh, and so that was, uh, I, I, I believe that through social justice, that that hopefully will be healed soon, and that that mistake and oversight will be taken care of, because uh, I think you remember Member, Dr. McQuarrie, um, Susan Gwynn, who was here earlier, uh, we attended the Athlete Ally Pledge, which many of our high school students attended also, uh, which Mayor Mesa High School uh, conducted uh, this school year. And the Padres were the first professional sports team in the United States of America to take the Athlete Ally Pledge and support LGBT athletes in all sports. And that's, the, that's very, very important to us as an organization because in San Diego Unified, if anybody wants to play athletics, we welcome you all with open arms. And that's my report, President McQuarrie. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, I attended events, made visits, and, and participated in meetings. 
Uh, some of the, uh, the events I attended with the eighth grade AVID standout, where one student from each of the 14 participating middle schools were recognized for outstanding scholarship. And it's the incredible work that AVID is doing to uh, help students develop good study skills, good leadership, and we are seeing the results. I was also at a press conference at St. Stephen's Church, where we talked about a partnership with our uh, schools and, and our churches and communities for a summer program, so that our students have a place to go during the summer, they won't have have that education lag that we call, where they uh, get no additional instruction during the summer. It was a great, great partnership. I'm very pleased to be a part of that. Uh, I attended the Point Loma High School Music Department fundraiser, uh, where they were expecting to raise $115,000 in order to augment the budget. And I think maybe a lot of people here in the room were there. Uh, it was a great, great event. Uh, supporting music uh, and the arts uh, in the, uh, the Point Loma cluster. Um, I attended classified personnel employees recognition, uh, as we all did. It was a great event. We acknowledged our classified, understand the importance of respect, and understand the importance of, of working with classified in order to continue the work that they do that allows students to, to succeed. Uh, um, I went to the California Women's Lead Luncheon, which is uh, up, up and coming women who want to run for political office, and it was an opportunity to acknowledge their effort and to encourage them. A major event was the JROTC 69th Annual Awards Ceremony, where we have 13 high schools, and their JROTC uh, did their final awards ceremony. It was held at Lincoln High School, and it was an incredible display, and you saw some of that uh, today in, in each one of our meetings uh, when we have a, a, a JROTC uh, presentation of the colors. Um, I attended the Pacific Beach Middle School Civics Learning Award, uh, where P PB Middle School, along with Kumaya Middle School, Elementary School, were two out of 10,000 schools to receive the award for Civics Learning Education. It's a great event and a, and a unique opportunity and an incredible uh, display of skill uh, at the Pacific Beach Middle School. Um, I visited uh, Crawford High School, the restorative justice Monday morning uh, check-in, uh, and then uh, I did the, the, uh, the tour uh, at, at, at Crawford, uh, and, and, and then I, another day, did a uh, tour of EDCO, where we have our recycling, and an incredible uh, uh, effort there, and our students are participating and learning how to recycle, and we have this uh, a great program and our partnership with many businesses, and that's one of them. In terms of meetings, uh, I, I met with the Language Acquisition Department. Uh, I attended a Kearney Cluster meeting. Uh, I met with our students and teachers in the Restorative Justice Program. And I went to Sacramento for a CSBA delegates, uh, delegates meeting with uh, new, uh, new trustee Sharon Whitehurst Payne, uh, and where we had a great opportunity to learn more and to network and to become actively involved in making education better from a state level down to our local level. I then returned to Sacramento with Superintendent Martin, Trustee Whitehurst Payne, and, and Financial Officer Jenny Salkild, and we went to Sacramento, and the, the outstanding event for me was being recognized on the floor of the State Senate. Um, where uh, Senator Marty Block uh, introduced us. Uh, we met the uh, 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 Senate President Pro Tem, uh, Kevin DeLeon, who was a graduate from San Diego High School, now is leading the Senate in the state of California, and what does that say about us and, and what we do for civics learning and education. We also uh, met with uh, Ben Hueso, uh, was on the floor as well, uh, and we uh, were doing some uh, uh, field work, uh, knocking on some doors, and um, doing our best to improve the education in California, specifically in San Diego. Completing the reports, uh, I would like a motion to adopt the board consent agenda in its entirety, items F1 through F5. So moved. We have speakers for board consent item F4, the resolution recognizing June 2016, National Gun Safety Month, and F5, the resolution in support of SB 1041, electric and gas rates for schools. So each speaker will have, um, we got a minute? Yeah. Uh, so, F4. Uh, we have Carol Landale, Elizabeth Harley, Judy Hubber, and Susan Taylor in support of the 
resolution recognizing June 2016 National Gun Safety Month and incidentally when we were on the floor uh, of the State Senate they were discussing the bill that would uh, require the uh, reg uh, uh, registration of people purchasing what, uh, bullets. What, uh, thank you. So Carol, Elizabeth, Judy, and Susan. Thank you. Good evening. I'm uh, Carol Landale, and thank you, Mr. Visa. Thank you, Mr. Barrera, for putting together the resolution recognizing National Gun Safety Month this June. National Gun Safety, uh, Gun Violence Awareness Day is actually on June the 2nd, and students and community members um, across the country are going to mark this day by wearing orange. This may be something that the schools in San Diego District would like to get involved with to bring about more awareness to the problem that we have. With an alarming increase in students bringing guns to schools and an increase in the number of unintended shootings in the home, it is really essential that schools play a part in informing communities about gun safety. School police reports show that San Diego Unified has had at least one gun incident a year in recent years. Fortunately, fortunately, the number is low and there haven't been any um, tragedies resulting from it. Thank you. Yeah. Elizabeth? Thank you for recognizing June as National Gun Safety Month and including information on what is commonly known as the Safe Storage Act. As directed by Superintendent Torlickson, schools can remind and educate parents about how to keep their kids safe around firearms, both in their own home and in the homes that their children play in. Three years ago, two Scripps Ranch school children were playing in a garage. The dad thought he had hidden the gun safely in that garage. He thought it wasn't loaded. Tragically, a young boy died. Two families' lives have been forever impacted. A family loses a beautiful son, and another child's father is sentenced to four years in jail for not properly storing the weapon and endangering the life of a child. What is the Safe Storage Act? California requires that guns be stored unloaded and in a locked container with ammunition locked separately if you have children under the age of 18 in the home, even if that also includes children that are not your own if they're visiting. California law states that it's a third degree misdemeanor to store a gun where a child can access it, regardless of whether or not the child finds it. Thank you. Thank you. Judy? Hello, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, sadly, school shootings and threats are now becoming routine, as President Obama has noticed. A situation this past March in Bellingham High School in Washington State shows how vital it is to empower students to report a threat of gun violence. A student was arrested after he told his peers he planned to shoot up the school. A police lieutenant credited the student's friends for alerting the principal. If others are ever in the same situation as this boy's friends, the lieutenant said, tell someone, do what happened here. And the fact is that in four out of five school shootings, at least one other person had prior knowledge of the attacker's plans, but failed to report it. And in two thirds of cases, more than, more than one person knew of the shooter's plans. But many of the threats go unreported because of fear of retaliation or being labeled a snitch. However, a survey found that 83% of middle school students would report a student with a weapon at school if they could do so anonymously. The good news is that there is a program called Speak Up, which uses a toll free hotline line for students to report threats while keeping your identity secret. I highly recommend that the school district adopt the Speak Up program. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Susan Taylor. Good evening. I'm a retired English teacher with the district and uh, I live in a school board district D, my first time before the board. I'm here tonight to speak about ASK. ASK is part of the resolution under consideration tonight. ASK is an acronym meaning Asking Saves Kids. And this is how it works. When parents send their children to the homes of their friends, they simply ask the adults in that home if there is a gun. If the answer is yes, invite the kids to stay at your house where you can safeguard them. Some people think it's an awkward question. Well, with being a parent, awkward questions come. 
We ask about swimming pools, unfenced yards, animals, allergens, and we need to ask if there is a gun in the home. One out of every three homes with children have guns. Children will play. For teens, the consequences are dire. Often depressed and by nature impulsive, suicide could be the consequence. Every day, nine children under the age of 15 are shot in accidents. Please consider uh, approving the resolution with ask concluded. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. So we have speakers on F5 before we take a vote. Citizen. I oppose this resolution SB 1041 because it means that taxpayers will have to pay to subsidize school energy use. That means we get taxed again. A special rate for electric service specific to K-12 public schools means that we, the rest of us, are going to have to pay more on our bills to subsidize the district costs. The school district fails to have a balanced budget because it wastes a lot of money. Electric and gas costs are a basic budget item that you need to be budgeting for. An example of the waste would be given the district attorney, the district lawyer over here, a $27,000 raise. Another example would be um, paying $4 million for medical insurance for people who were not entitled to coverage, and you did nothing to get that money back. Um, another example would be paying teachers to move to another classroom because their classroom is being re renovated up to 64 hours. And we're paying for contractors to have a professional moving company move that classroom. Now the school board is using, mm, I oppose it. You shouldn't have this law, you should budget better. Thank you, citizen. Are you ready to vote? We had a motion, we had a second. Cast your vote. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Moving to um, item G, G1. I'll move item G1. Second. Okay, uh, we have speakers. Uh, no, not G1. G, uh, no, nothing on G1. All right. Thank you, President McQuarrie. This is about the renaming of Kearney High School International Business, and the recommendation is to name it to Kearney High School of College Connections. This is a conversation that started in the community from September 2015, the Kearney community from September 2015 through January 2016. As you know, the current electives that are being offered at Kearney, which include AVID in grades nine through 12, fit under a broader umbrella of college preparation, leading to multiple dual enrollment courses while our students are still enrolled in high school. So the SIB students now routinely graduate having earned multiple college credits through three different programs at Mesa College, the Fast Track Program, the Accelerated College Program, and the Legacy Program. So this proposed new change of the school more accurately reflects the essential pathways that are already existing at the school and it will clearly communicate the focus of the school to better represent what's actually happening at the campus. So that's the recommendation we're bringing forward. Went through the names committee with all the supporting documentation provided in this item. Okay. Uh, any questions, comments? Like a motion? Yes, motion and second. You already did that. Pass your vote. We did that. Well, motion passes. I'll move item G2 to rename Robert E. Lee Elementary School to Pacific View Leadership Elementary School. <laughs> All right, we have a moved and seconded. Uh, we have speakers on G2. There are five, but first let's do staff comments, superintendent report. Thank you, President McQuarrie. <coughs> Excuse me. We're bringing forward this item, and this is an exact example of student voice and agency, an example of kids leading the change that we were seeing, that was being sought after at this school. And you, we will ha hear from the students tonight specifically, but the community, as you may have heard, was split on this issue. And we led a process in which in October, October 23rd, we had a community meeting, and then on December 2nd, we had a community meeting, so we could begin to hear what folks were thinking about in terms of the renaming of Lee Elementary 
Elementary School. Then March 14th through April 13th, the principal led a process at her school, Principal Sylvia Martinez, who I'm sure is here. I just don't see where, there you are, Sylvia. Sylvia, thank you. She led a process with her instructional leadership team, the teachers at the school, and developed a curriculum-based approach to having a conversation using a democratic process at the school site to pick a new name for their school. And what happened was, it was a beautiful process that she led. All of the teachers, the students, the classrooms were able to participate, and they started with a discussion in their classrooms about the school's vision statement. Who are we and what is the identity of our school? What do we represent and how will a name that we select represent who we are and what we believe in? So in that process from kindergarten all the way through, students studied historical figures that would represent the ideas of their identity and who they believe they are and what they want, how a name would represent that. So after each of these lessons took place, conversations took place in the classroom, they proposed a new name for the school. So a couple of names came forward. And then on April 13th, the ILT, or their electoral college as they call it, met and they analyzed the recommendations and they came up with two choices. Pacific View Leadership Academy and Amelia Earhart Elementary School were the two that they discussed. And they ended up having a vote in the auditorium or two assemblies at the school where they were able to vote. And when the votes were counted, that's the name that came up with the most votes was Pacific View Leadership Elementary. And and I, there are folks here tonight, I think, that will speak. I think the students are here that will be able to speak about where these ideas came from and why this, they believe this is a very important new name that's coming forward and the vision came exactly from the students led by the teachers and the staff at the school. So with that, I know we have some um, comments students? from the school. Sure. So um, uh, speakers include Daniel Schmischkowski, Francine Magu. Stephanie Brassard, Fabiola Cheda, Sylvia Martinez, and Richard McNamee. So let's start with David, Francine, and Stephanie, please. Daniel, or rather, Daniel. Hello, Daniel. Oh, he has, uh, we two have minutes. two minutes. Two minutes, Charles. Two minutes. Uh, honorable board, the superintendent, members of the public. I'd rather go down with the ship and tell the truth than get saved in a lifeboat and tell a lie. There's more behind this than the changing of the Robert E. Lee School. The casual citizen in San Diego has no idea what goes on behind the curtains, inside politics. I do, and I know what goes on, because I know each and every one of you, and I've been to all the meetings, and I know your cash cow, and I know without your $200,000 cash cow, those votes up there would not always be five to nothing, because we need more diversity of opinion on this board. You talk about justice? I hear people talking about justice all day today. There's no justice to this. The majority of citizens in San Diego oppose this name change. You know it, I know it, and anyone that tells the truth knows it. And yet you're going forward with this. But I'm reminded of that movie, that television series in the 1960s, The Untouchables. You are untouchable. You can't touch. And you know, I'm no longer a candidate, thank God. Because if I was a candidate, I'd lose everything I have. I'd lose the roof on my house, and I couldn't do it. And I was being led to the gallows, and I knew I had to get out of it, so I failed to make the ballot. Thank God. But I'll tell you what. You really need more diversity of opinion. The French generals in Algiers plotted in World War II for surrender. They did, they plotted for surrender. I surrender. Thank you, Dana. Francine. 
Well, good evening. The one thing we can agree on that is that diversity is very much important. That's the reason why we're here tonight. Good evening. I'm Francine Mayige, District Director for Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez, whose statement regarding the school board's decision to rename Robert Lee, e, excuse me, Robert E. Lee Elementary School, I'll be sharing with you tonight. After more than a year working on this issue, I'm thrilled the school district is finally addressing what should have probably never happened, the naming of one of our schools after a figure whose legacy is having led an army against the United States to preserve slavery. I thank all the members of our community who joined in this important conversation and applaud the student-centered process that brought us to this point to celebrate another step forward in creating learning environments that are inclusive of all students. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Francine. <laughs> Stephanie, then Fabiola. Stephanie, you're not Stephanie. Am I next? No, Stephanie is. They, they want to wait. Oh, they want to wait. I got. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, absolutely. They, they told it. me to go first. Thank you. They're right. Gen I got it. Gentlemen's first. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Richard McNamee. Okay. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and I went to a school called Fairview. <coughs> I don't remember a thing about it. Then I went to high school, named after Theodore Roosevelt, and uh, his motto was, "The strenuous life." And that's something that I adopted for my life, which is running out here, and I'm not as strenuous as I used to be. But anyway, uh, also, Theodore Roosevelt uh, led the, uh, uh, what do you call them, the Rough Riders. <laughs> Teddy. And uh, Teddy. they uh, went on the San Juan Hill and took uh, Cuba away from S the Spain. And that's the kind of guy I like. And uh, uh, the general, Robert E. Lee, is that kind of guy. Although he was a son of, uh, southern gentleman and he uh, was a leader and the and the general of the Northern Army of Virginia. And for four years he fought for the South. And that's all. Before that and after that he was an American citizen. And uh, uh, a little footnote, uh, I just learned that all slave owners were not white. There were some black slave owners. So it has, really has nothing to do with race it has to do with slavery and freedom. And slavery can be what we think of as in the South, but it can also be a personal slavery, slave to alcohol, to tobacco, that type of thing. So I'm, uh, I think it's a rather insipid decision for you to vote for a school that has been named after a great American patriot and they call it uh, Pacific View or Amelia Earhart, although she was a Thank you, Richard. famous character. Thank you. So, in, in whatever order you choose. All right, sure. cool. Thank you. And you are? Fabiola Tejeda. Thank you. Good evening, Board President, Board Trustees, and Superintendent Martin. My name is Fabiola Tejeda, and I am a student at Lee Elementary. I am here to share with you the opportunity that was given to us to change our school's name. Our community was divided, and we hope to be reconnected. We have taken this opportunity very seriously. Through a series of lessons from our teachers, we have learned the importance of a name. We learned that a name represents our values and vision. We were then given four names that were suggested in November survey to the community. These names were Amelia Earhart, Roberto Alvarez, Frederick Douglass, and Susan B. Anthony. We researched their history and their character on how they connect with our school vision. During the research, a student suggested Pacific View Leadership Elementary. This became very popular and with so much support, the suggestion was added to the nomination ballot. After researching each of the suggestions, each class voted on their top two favorites. This result 
and two nominees for the final vote. As a result, the final ballot consisted of Amelia Earhart Elementary and Pacific View Leadership Elementary. The day before the vote, a classmate and I presented speeches during two rallies. The day came, the staff, students, parents, and community members were given a chance to vote for, for their favorite name. The tallies were counted and Pacific View Leadership Elementary won. Board members and Superintendent Martin, we are asking that you support our decision in changing our school's name from Marby Lee Elementary to Pacific View Leadership Elementary. Thank you. Thank you. And your name, please? Stephanie Broussard. Thank you, Stephanie. Good evening, Board President, Board Trustees, and Superintendent Martin. My name is Stephanie Broussard. I'm here to talk to you about our school name change, Pacific View Leadership Elementary. I believe Pacific View Leadership Elementary fits our school for two reasons. First of all, from our playground, we have a beautiful view of the Pacific Ocean. Plus, the word Pacific means peaceful, and our school is very peaceful and calm. Additionally, the Pacific has a lot of history relate, related to diversity, which also represents our school. In 1521, a Spanish expedition led by Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan was the first known crossing of the Pacific Ocean. They then named it Pacific Sea. The Spanish controlled the trade that crossed from Mexico to the Philippines and vice versa until 1815. Secondly, leadership. Leadership is a part of our school vision to develop community leaders. In conclusion, our school should be named Pacific View Leadership Elementary because we are taught leadership skills which we will use throughout our lives and because we have an enchanting view of the Pacific Ocean. So please support the name Pacific View Leadership Elementary. Thank you. Our last speaker. Sylvia Martinez. Good afternoon, uh, board president, board trustees, and superintendent Martin. My name is Sylvia Martinez. I am the principal of Lee Elementary. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. As you have already heard from my two students, Fabiola and Stephanie, Lee Elementary has gone through a very engaging, real world learning experience. I am so proud of the Lee community, the staff, the students, and the parents. We came together to come up with a name that defined us as a school and as a community. We want to be defined as a school that is inspiring, collaborative, and sets high expectations. The name chosen by the students speaks not only of our beautiful view of the Pacific Ocean, but also to our belief in creating and nurturing, contributing leaders to, to society. I humbly ask that you validate our students' work and rename the school Pacific View Leadership Elementary. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments from the board? Yes. Vice President. Well, I just want to thank the, uh, the entire community who went through this process. Uh, including the community that saw that there was uh, an, an obvious uh, contradiction, um, you could say obvious hypocrisy in the fact that we had a school in, in our city, in San Diego, um, that carried a name that was associated with absolutely with racism and, and and a past that is, is disgraceful in this country. And the community uh, got together, got organized. I thank uh, Assemblymember Gonzalez and, and her staff for working with the community uh, to, to bring this issue to people's consciousness. But most importantly, I thank the students, uh, and we had you know uh, Fabiola and Stephanie speak so magnificently, and you represented your school so well here tonight, um, for the process that you went through, uh, to do your research, to understand uh, the the history involved, uh, and and to create new history 
Um, in the future, students at Pacific View uh, Leadership Elementary, um, when they do their research, they're going to know about the work that you did, um, that you led a process uh, where you made change in your community, and it's historic, the work that you did, and, and you, should, you should feel proud of that. Um, so you showed our entire community how to go through a process um, with grace, um, with substance, uh, with civility, and you've come to us and given us a gift uh, in being able to support the decision that you made at your school. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you to you your le and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon Whitehurst Payne. And I too want to thank the principal, the students, and that entire community for their work. I, I visited that campus and surprisingly, they do have a beautiful view of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, if you're ever on that campus and then hear the students so eloquently say that it represents peace and a beautiful uh, view. And I think that's very true. That campus has a, a spirit of peace there and calmness. Uh, it's a nice little campus and uh, I was very impressed and have been invited to come back again as soon as I get to all the other schools uh, because you're doing a great job there and uh, I want to commend you. Uh, this whole issue of uh, the name change is, from my perspective, essential. Uh, this summer I was in South Carolina when they had the incident and flew from there to Virginia and happened to visit Sussex County, Virginia and they had the statues and all of that. So I'm very excited about us here in San Diego moving forward. Um, let's let the past be the past and move forward so that we can have the healing that Sarah Collins Jordan talked about. Let's, let's heal. And uh, I commend the school in taking this action and moving forward. Thank you. Trustee okay. Johnny Evans. Yeah, I think this is a really uh, important moment in Vision 2020. We talk a lot about critical and, and creative thinking and this is an example of it. We've seen over the past two or three years a lot of very tragic events in this in this country uh, directly related to racism and, and I know I have sat on the board for many years and we look at all the schools and we know the names of the schools and don't think much about it and uh, uh, that's kind of been raised in everyone's consciousness by by the recent events and that's why why we're looking at it but I think the most important thing about this is this not is not just the board sitting up here and saying okay we don't like this we're going to change it there's a real grassroots effort uh, Assembly member Gonzalez brought it up, people in the community talked about it, and then really the school went to, to work on this. And, and as, as the other trustees said, this, is, this was a very important uh, learning moment for everyone to really analyze, not just to make a, a knee-jerk reaction, but really to look at what, what is the meaning of, of the name that is there currently, what is the history of that, why, why was that acceptable at one point in time, why is it not acceptable now, and, and how do we move forward from this point, and, and the whole issue of what is the identity of our school is, is very important, and it's, it's a real opportunity that students were able to look at and say, this is what, what our school is about, and I'm very impressed uh, by the name you've come up with. I'm impressed by the community, the staff, and the students, so congratulations for very good work. Um, I want to say thank you to Assembly Member Lorena Gonzalez for helping to focus the laser light of attention on this issue. I remember when I was first elected to the school board six years ago, we were going through some reports up here at the dais, and I remember scrolling down a list of all the schools, and one of them in Sheila Jackson's area was Robert E. Lee Elementary School, and I was shocked that we had an elementary school after somebody that symbolizes racism, slavery, discrimination, and fought against the United States of America. And I remember having conversations with her about moving this forward and trying to do something about it. And then when Marnie Foster was uh, uh, elected to the school board, I talked to Marnie Foster about it. And she had said that there were, they were doing some work with the naming committee to look into it. Uh, that there was going to be, it was going to be a community effort. And then we had the horrible tragedy in the South 
And then Lorena Gonzalez started banging the bells together, crashing the cymbals, drawing attention to it. So uh, I am so thankful that we are at this point now. You know, there's a saying that you can, if you want to go alone, go fast. But if you want to go far, go together. And that's an African proverb. And so this process, we didn't run out here two weeks after the incident with another name for the school. We allowed the children and the community and the teachers and the principal to engage in, the, in a process to figure out what would be an appropriate name for the school and the children that go there. And I think one thing that's most telling is that the name that's coming forward from the community was not one of the original four recommendations. And I think that that is phenomenal. I want to thank the two incredibly eloquent leaders from the elementary school. You are fantastic ladies, fantastic leaders. And you can do anything and be anything you want. You can even be president of the United States of America one day, I hope. Um, so I, I am, am so happy to be supporting Pacific View Ridge Leadership Elementary School. Yeah. I also would like to acknowledge our ambassadors from what I hope will be Pacific View Leadership Elementary School and want to acknowledge the process. It really brings together board resolutions and the effort that we've set over the last couple of years in terms of civics learning, cultural competency, and ethnic studies. We have students working together with uh, our assembly uh, member. Uh, we have students and assembly member working with schools. Uh, we came together about the process. For me, it was a lot, had a lot to do with the process. How could we take a situation, work together to make it better? We have that opportunity here uh, tonight uh, to take an action that will culminate the work that has taken place throughout the year. And I'm uh, pleased to be able to vote in favor of this name change. So let's cast our votes. So we will now hear item G3, a board item to propose a new vision 2020 goal. Trustees Dr. Whitehurst Payne and Dr. John Lee Evans, please introduce your item. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President McQuarrie. McQuarrie, we can see the, the results of the last group uh, talked about the Pacific Ocean and mm -hmm. peacefulness, and I have never seen a quieter, more orderly exit from this auditorium than that group. Well said. Uh, item G3. Uh, the board met with the Community College Board about three weeks ago, and we discussed the fact that uh, we are moving towards the arena of offering more college courses in high schools. In fact, most of our campuses already offer them. I think there was one, and I won't say the name of that one, that is not, but they're moving in that direction for next year. And when we say um, college courses, community college courses, we're also talking about uh, IB classes, international baccalaureate classes, the advanced placement courses. Um, we're talking about also expanding to a career technical education pathway course in addition to participation in an internship or an apprenticeship program. We would like to suggest 
for the Vision 2020 that every student be required to take a course, a community college or one of these listed courses, and or for those people who feel that students should not be held to uh, community college or college courses, we're also including internship or apprenticeship programs. Although if folks really realize that a lot of the apprenticeship programs, if you actually go through and get that certificate, you're only three courses away from a community college AA certificate, which then would lead to a four year degree if you're interested in it. So my colleague here and I are moving forward to request that the superintendent explore um, putting that requirement in place for us and bringing it back to the board. Just want to add a little. Just want to add a little bit uh, to that um, in terms of having uh, students take a, a community college course. We have, we've uh, increased our graduation requirements with the ADG requirements, and at the same time, we've uh, increased our graduation rates, so we see that with higher expectations, our students uh, certainly uh, achieve a lot more. One of the things we've seen for years, for probably 30 years, I don't know exactly, many decades, we've been offering this dual credit of, of high school and community college, but it's typically taken, these courses are typically taken by the most advanced students, most of whom are going on to an opportunity in a four-year college when in fact we really want to get the students who are, who are strong candidates for community college an opportunity to take one of those courses while they're in high school to really become linked up with, uh, with the community college. Uh, some people when they look at the, uh, requir the AG requirements have said, well, not every uh, student is going to go to college to a UC or a California State University and, and we don't expect uh, that 100 percent of our students are necessarily going to go to college. But they are going to need some sort of advanced training, whether it's in a trade, a technical career, uh, whatever it is. And the community college really embodies that because you can go to community college as preparation uh, for, uh, for getting a PhD in astronomy and physics, or you can go to community college uh, to be prepared to become a welder and, and, and everything else uh, in between. So it's, it's just a real natural marriage between the high school and, and the community colleges. And we really wanted, when we were talking about this at the our last board meeting uh, with the community college district was really to accelerate this effort. And so if we can look forward in Vision 2020 that uh, the class of 2020 is now in the uh, eighth grade and I would hope that by the time they graduate they would have had the opportunity to take at least one community college course or something similar. So that's, that's why we're uh, proposing this to, as, as part of uh, an ongoing effort to uh, continue to raise our standards of our students and our expectations for what they're able to achieve. We do not have any speakers. We have comments from the board. Would this require one community college course to graduate? Well, I, I know we talked about require or, or, or access opportunity. Uh, I think those details need to be worked out by the, the superintendent in terms of what is the best way to, to, to accomplish this so that uh, rather than just arbitrarily saying this is the way it's going to be, what is the best way to have, have success with, uh, with this type of program, okay. looking at what the requirements are in terms of the okay, curriculum so, and so forth. So uh, if what I'm hearing is that this is a, a, an action item to ask the superintendent to look at making it available mm -hmm. for all students to take at least one community college course, but it's not necessarily, you're not necessarily asking for it to be a requirement for graduation, is that correct? Not necessarily. I would say, and you can not necessarily, but 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 that would certainly be open to interpretation by the superintendent if there if if it fits in with the program. Okay, well I'll I'll vote for it, uh -huh. it you know, if it's to provide access, but mm -hmm. I don't I don't feel comfortable voting to add another graduation requirement at this point in time. Exactly, exactly. That's okay. that's what has to be looked at because okay. what the other requirements if it if it dovetails with the other requirements, that's one thing. The whole point is to starting off with access, absolutely. But, but, um, but really increasing the access, because sometimes we talk about access, uh, you know, we do offer these courses, a lot of high schools, we could say they're offered every high school, but that's not the same as, as it, it's sort of, when you're talking about this, to me it's sort of in between access and requirement. 
it's it's encouragement. Right. Yeah. And you note know, there it says also internship and apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of times we need to start thinking about students getting involved in internships so that they don't graduate and have no plan. N Correct. Neither to go to college right. nor an internship somewhere. I mean, so this at least would force them to start thinking about yeah. uh, what they want to do. And I think to uh, Trustee Evans' point is just because it's offered at a, at a high school, you, we, we offer a couple community college courses, maybe there's only 60 slots. And that's clearly not enough capacity to allow all students who maybe would be interested in taking a, a course uh, to have that ability. But so There's also, at Morse High School, apparently we have another program that's coming online where students can take classes online and get college credit for them. Um, in fact, today they just opened uh, the program uh, and they're starting out there. I think they're, maybe one of your staff members knows about it, but um, this ties in with that idea that we had talked about for Lincoln possibly, uh, the fact that students are interested in taking, there are seven students interested in taking a class and we don't have enough for a class, but if there's a way, we can link them up through technology so that maybe seven from uh, Lincoln and six from Crawford and um, the rest from Morris could link up via, um, you know, something electronically, then they could take that class and get credit. So we're, we're trying to think outside of the box and not the just traditional model. And, and just to clarify too, and I was just looking over again on, on what we had written here, it says we believe and understand that this is not a one size fits all proposal and that this should not be a mandated graduation requirement. It's about making opportunities available and accessible to all students. So that's it. So I can just weigh in a little bit even though we, we um, tonight is just asking for us to take a look at this. We, we started to take a look at it knowing this resolution was coming and it's definitely something that we're, we're want to consider and it's very much in alignment with what we're doing. I'm looking back at our notes for the joint meeting with the community college board and one of the things we talked about that night is wanting to rapidly accelerate the enrollment in dual enrollment. 750 out of 35,000 is not enough. So you already sort of talked about that at the joint board meeting and so this resolution is in alignment with that or resolution, is that what we're calling it? Resolution? <laughs> and so the staff has already had a preview of it and we will be looking at what the implications will be to implement something like this at, and it's definitely already part of Vision 2020. Now let's think about what the next steps are. Right. And, so, and the direction is really as, as we're ending the school year and as you continue to make the, the plans yeah. for the coming year and following years to just sort of an advance notice of finding a way to in, incorporate that. So the action is just to move forward in yeah. the coming years. Any more questions or comments? Is the motion? She moved it, I second it. Okay. If no additional question, uh, comments, uh, Pat, cast your vote. Okay. And is unanimous. Thank you. Now moving to item H. H1, H1 is the public hearing. We will now hear item H1, the final environmental impact report for Point Loma High School, whole site modernization and athletic facilities upgrade project and conduct the public hearing. It's an opportunity for members of the audience to submit speaker requests on this item is now closed. The board will not accept any more requests on this item. Please note the board received many emails and correspondence, both opposing and supporting this project, and copies have all been provided to the board and most recently received since this past Friday is included in a brown envelope that we have here on the dais. Remembering this is a, a difficult, complex issue that involves many feelings, uh, involves a, a number of concerns, uh, and we have this opportunity for the, um, for the public to share their concerns and issues. 
and we want the concerns and issues shared by the public uh, on this issue to focus on the final review, to focus on where we are now, and focus on the facts and the issues. And while there be, are people who have strong feelings and positions, we do expect there to be a, a quorum of civility. Everybody have, participants, speakers having the opportunity to share their point of view, their issues and concerns, and we expect that they will be treated with respect. So we'll have, a, our staff will make a presentation, uh, we'll have public comments, and then uh, we'll have board deliberations, and then with a final action on the resolution. Superintendent Martin, please present the item. Thank you, President McQuarrie. I have our team here that has worked diligently to make sure that this item is prepared. We have a PowerPoint and a presentation. As you know, we're proposing our multi-phase modernization of Point Loma High School in accordance with the Point Loma High School master plan. And so what you'll hear tonight is the staff's presentation about how we're moving forward with this project as a part of the campus-wide improvements that are necessary for Point Loma High School as in accordance with Prop S and Prop Z, our school district's general obligation bond measures that that were passed in 2008 and 2012, respectively. Now we'll listen and hear more about the master plan and the modernization so that you'll be clear around where we're heading. Okay, uh, good evening, uh, President McQuarrie, members of the board, Superintendent Martin, and Point Loma community. Um, this is a public hearing to consider the certification of the EIR for Point Loma High School whole site modernization. I'm gonna cover the proposed uh, project scope and my colleague, Kimberly Chapin here, will discuss the environmental impact report. Um, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the diligent work of, um, of our project management team. Uh, last night we had the classified staff appreciation last week. A lot of work was done by our team, our CEQA consultants, um, Kimberly, Andra, and our legal services department throughout this entire process. I'd also like to um, to appreciate all the Point Loma stakeholders, um, both uh, for and against this project. Um, uh, we held a lot of um, meetings, and we really, I really appreciate your input and dialogue through, during the meetings. I think your input helped to inform the final project. And uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, Kevin Gormley, a uh, long time vice principal at uh, Point Loma High School who is uh, battling a rare form of brain cancer and uh, we, we worked on several projects together and I just wanna say uh, my, my thoughts and prayers are with his family today. Uh, this, is a, this is an aerial view of Point Loma High depicting the campus which is situated between Chatsworth, Clove, Alcott, and Voltaire Streets. Our goal is to, to improve the campus for, that, for that, uh, those kids from the class of 2029 that we saw earlier tonight. Um, this, um, we opened um, Point Loma High in 1925 and, and its original buildings were replaced for earthquake safety. The current uh, buildings were constructed and renovated over the last, past nine decades. And we've done uh, these kind of master plans uh, for all of our high schools and larger schools throughout the district. Um, this master plan um, develops uh, a renovation plan for building replacement and um, helps us, helps inform where new buildings should go so that we can plan, you know, both near, near and long term in the future. And we held a series of uh, six public meetings with neighbors, parents, and teachers. Um, the items um, to be uh, modified on the master plan are color coded. So the red uh, items depicting um, a new structure or building, blue, a renovated building, and then yellow signifying no work or minimal work um, in, a, in a building that's been recently modified or, or doesn't need modification. And then there's green space and hardscape that's delineated as well. The modernization plan was divided into two phases of campus. 
uh, renovation, and then also the athletic facilities upgrade was also divided into into two phases to efficiently complete all the planned improvements and to allow the continuation of school operations and minimize disruption in teaching and learning. The first phase of the whole site modernization construction is planned to start in 2018 and the work focuses around replacing the existing 800 building with a new three-story classroom building that includes a library and a, and a media center. The work also includes modernizing um, the classroom buildings 200 and 300 and near the front of the school. Uh, the, the second phase of campus modernization starts in, uh, the construction starts in 2020 and the work focuses around a new cafeteria food service and custodial supply building to replace building 400. There's also some ADA improvements um, in the landscape areas, renovating the gym, locker rooms, and administration facilities. This is an elevation view of improvements as you will see them along Chatsworth uh, Boulevard. You can see the new three-story building with um, buildings 200 and 300 behind a new architectural facade. Um, the architectural uh, structure of the new buildings are all unified now and, and there's improved security along Chatsworth. This is another view um, from the opposite direction across the new academic courtyard that's created by replacing that building 800 and, it's, and, and with a new building. And then here's a close up view of the new classroom library and media center building um, as it, uh, from Chatsworth. This is a, a list of proposed athletic facilities improvements which obviously received considerable interest in the community. I'm not gonna read the entire list, but I'm gonna kind of go over some of the highlights of this. Um, the, the home side be bleachers are gonna remain uh, at a 2,000 uh, seat capacity, which is, um, which is based on our district standard of seating the entire school on the home side. And then we're gonna provide a new 500 seat visitor uh, bleacher system um, to, which is, um, aligned with our district standard as well. And then, um, you know, and then, let me you know, give you a, a little picture of it and walk through some of the other um, improvements. Um, the visitor side bleachers, um, you can see um, the restroom and concession building that's planned, uh, located directly behind the bleachers here. Um, we're also gonna be replacing the PA system and removing the existing speaker poles on the home side of the field and we'll install seven new speaker poles and you can see them depicted here. Um, there'll be three uh, poles on the visitor side, 20 feet tall and four 29 foot poles on the home side. The idea of installing um, speakers, more speakers closer to the audience will reduce the overall PA volume that's required to um, communicate with the audience, so lower the overall volume in the stadium. Also, um, field lighting will be mounted to four 70-foot tall poles on the inside of the track. The poles are gonna be marked with uh, double red solid lights in accordance with FAA regulations. And this project was in, in, approved by the San Diego County Regional Airport Land Use Commission in November of 2015. It'll also be, uh, poles to light the bleachers, both on the home and visitor side. So two 30-foot poles are gonna be required to immediately behind the visitor bleachers and four 20-foot grandstand light poles will be installed on the home side bleachers. And the reason why the bleacher lighting is, is needed is to allow for safe exiting. And, um, and they're, they're, because of the, the design of the 70-foot um, field light poles and how it has such has minimized spillage. Um, there's very little light spillage from those um, poles into the bleacher system. So they're, the bleachers are essentially dark without uh, bleacher lights. Um, we also uh, plan to construct a, a new ticket office, about 125 square foot ticket office, allow uh, multiple entry into the facility, and um, we're relocating the um, long jump, triple jump, high jump and pole vault facilities um, because of the location of the poles near the uh, relocation of light poles.
this, uh, this rendering actually provides a better perspective of the home side bleacher improvements and you can see um, the press box, it's a 140 square foot press box along with the, uh, an elevator to, um, to provide disabled access to the press box. These, these improvements will create an opportunity for evening games um, and allow parents to actually watch their athletes, um, par working parents to watch their athletes participate in sports. <laughs> also, um, you know, one of the challenges with, with having, uh, especially after daylight savings is, is um, Students have to sacrifice class time, get out of class early to participate in sports during, during the daylight hours. Um, and visiting teams have to leave their, their schools early in order to participate in games. So the, the, the goal of, of this project uh, in terms of stating improvements is to facilitate um, the athletic experience and also allow um, their friends and family to, to uh, watch their athletes participate. I want to talk a little bit about stakeholder input. Um, so we had a, a, a number of stakeholder meetings that, that fell into three major categories, site master planning, design task force, and field use policy. I want to focus a little bit on the field use policy um, because there were a lot of concerns um, expressed from the community um, and our goal was to, um, to try to strike the right balance between the, uh, the needs of the students and the needs of the community and the neighbor and respecting the neighboring homes. So um, after we heard concerns about from the neighbors about potential overuse of a lighted stadium, the facilities staff and legal department staff hosted a series of meetings with neighbors, teachers, parents, and we developed a first of its kind district use field use policy. And this policy was meant to be a compromise and, and to strike the right balance. And uh, finally, I wanna, um, um, oh, let me focus on one. I wanted to, I wanted to focus on, on a couple excerpts of the field use policy before I shift over to the phasing plan. Um, I'm just going to read to you from the field use policy. I know there's a, um, a number of people that are concerned about the real intent of the school district. Point Loma High School facilities shall be used primarily for the benefit of students attending schools in the Point Loma cluster. The athletic facilities will not be commercialized by allowing rampant use of outside leagues and organizations. Point Loma High School facilities may be made available to outside persons or community groups only when specific conditions are met. The use of the stadium lighting shall be limited to 18 nighttime events, not including playoff games or the use of lights to allow the completion of games and practices, which begin during the daylight hours, but carry over into darkness due to Pacific Standard Time. Oh. Finally, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the, the, the timing of the phases, the first, Phase of athletic facilities upgrades, including the field lighting and PA system improvements is planned to start this summer if the, this EIR is certified and should, should uh, be completed within nine months. The first phase of the whole site modernization, which is in design, um, will start construction in the summer of 2018. It's about a 24 month project. The second phase of athletic facilities upgrades starts in the summer of 2020 and um, the whole site modernization is time to co coincide with that as well, the second phase in 2020. And um, with that, I'll turn the floor over to my colleague, Kimberly Chapin, to talk about the environmental impact report. Good evening. I'm just going to go briefly through the process that staff and the consultants worked through in order to develop the final EIR. Um, it's important to note that CEQA is many of its processes and requirements are dictated by statute. And so, so long as you meet the statutory requirements, your analysis ends. That doesn't mean that there might be effects on the community. It just means that for purposes of CEQA, those types of effects need not be addressed in your environmental documents. So with that understanding, um, the purpose of CEQA and the environmental analysis is to fully inform the public and the decision makers prior to making 
decisions on projects that may have significant environmental impacts so that the decision makers can decide whether or not ultimately those significant effects um, are sufficient enough to warrant not approving a project. Um, in this case, we have identified um, two areas where there are significant environmental impacts. That would be to noise and to traffic. We'll talk about those a little bit more as we move through the rest of the presentation. Um, as another requirement of CEQA is public engagement, and we do this by ensuring that our draft environmental impact report is circulated for 45 days for members of the public and public agencies to submit comments. And um, it is often the case that a draft EIR is revised to reflect some of the concerns and the comments that were raised during the commenting period. Um, that type of revision signals success in the public engagement process for CEQA. It means we've heard you, there are things that we could do better in our EIR, and we're going to incorporate those changes to get a better document in the end. In our instance, this EIR has been in various phases of preparation for three years. Um, going back. Um, it began with the first notice of preparation <laughs> in uh, just, uh, May of 2013. Uh, there was then a scoping meeting, um, not technically required for members of the public, but the district engaged anyway in a scoping meeting to determine what the public thought would be the most significant issues to be addressed in an EIR. That was in May of 2013. A second notice of preparation was prepared um, a little more than two years later. And this wasn't because staff wasn't working on the EIR, it was because part of the analysis in the EIR was dependent on the FAA's determination as to no hazard. And it took a while to get that determination, and it took so long, in fact, that to get the determination on the lights that we ended up getting the whole site modernization determination roughly at the same time. Um, many of the comments uh, referred to how Originally, there were going to be two EIRs, one for stadium lights, one for whole site modernization. And the reason for that was is because the whole site modernization hadn't caught up in the planning process um, to the stadium facilities, which were, you know, from a constructability standpoint, much easier to plan than a whole site modernization. So unfortunately, because it took so long for one component to get their FAA hazard determination, the other one caught up in terms of its phasing. And so in order to avoid um, a, a piecemealing argument under CEQA, we decided that we would combine the two projects because they really were a whole site modernization project in which there were two components, modernization of the buildings, modernization of the stadium. Uh, so then we prepared the draft EIR. We circulated that draft EIR from February 29th until, um, not February 29th, basically from January until February 29th. We received comments. We received approximately 70 comments between public agencies and individuals. Uh, some of those comments were, consisted of 101 individual comments within a single comment letter. That's why we have an entire volume now dedicated to the response to comments. Um, staff worked really hard on the response to comments. We'll get into that a little bit later, but um, they were very detailed. Some of them included their own technical exhibits. So the, Turn up your mic, please. So the consultants um, analyze those exhibits in addition to the comment letters and provided individual response to those as well. Um, basically, uh, Lee alluded to it with a site location. Um, the site is in Point Loma. Uh, the Peninsula Community Plan actually defines the site as a highly urbanized area comprised of primarily residential with some commercial use. Uh, as Lee mentioned, the school was actually built in 1925. The stadium component was built in 1950, roughly. Um, both of those, by the way, predate the uh, implementation of CEQA, which was not until 1974. The 
findings in the EIR, we identified potentially significant effects to various areas, and they are identified here in the PowerPoint, um, the most significant of which is in the draft EIR, it was prepared based on a lighting plan that we thought um, although we were right at the threshold, we thought that there was a potential that it could trigger a potentially significant impact to light. Um, subsequent to the release of the draft EIR, that lighting plan was redesigned. We now have a much different lighting plan, and so in the final EIR, you will see that we have revised that to eliminate the significant effect on lights. Um, what we weren't able to eliminate were the significant and unavoidable impacts to noise and traffic. For any significantly um, or significant environmental impacts, uh, CEQA requires you to identify all feasible mitigation measures. We are able to do that for paleontology, geology, hazardous materials, and at least one uh, mitigation measure for transportation and traffic. We revised this slightly um, through the analysis in the draft EIR to beef up our mitigation measure in the transportation and traffic and also to clarify that we would implement that mitigation whenever there was going to be a projected 296 or more spectators or 148 more vehicles at any given event. Most of our impacts result from the operation of the facilities and principally with noise. You're getting your significant noise impacts from people arriving, the band playing, use of the PA system. Um, for traffic, it's roadway and intersections, and that's primarily driven by the additional capacity. And it's driven by the fact when we chose to undertake an EI for this project, we analyzed it as a maximum capacity, maximum usage facility. Um, you do that for CEQA purposes because it aids in identifying all potentially significant impacts. There's a, an example that happened here. When we went max capacity on our analysis, we went from having zero traffic impacts to the impacts that you have now doing a max capacity analysis. And so that was a deliberate choice on behalf of the consultants and, and Lee to say, let's make sure we've captured everything that could possibly result from the operation of this facility at maximum capacity. We're not gonna worry about the field use policy. We're not gonna worry about anything except what is our maximum potential for impacts. For the light and glare, on this particular slide, you can kinda get an idea of where we went in our lighting plan. At the top, it shows the evolution of field lighting, basically from what it was about 10 or 15 years ago, starting at your left, moving toward your right. The second pole from the right actually is Musco's design that we're using. Right next to it is a competitor's design. The field lighted on the top is what you would have expected to see prior to implementation of the revised lighting design. The picture at the bottom is what we expect to find using the shielding and the high intensity LED lights that frankly focus so much light on the field that we now have to put small up lights in order to see a ball being kicked across the field. So it's, it was a process um, getting the lighting so that it met the safety standards for uh, CIF regulation play. This next slide shows where the light spill may occur. And as you can see, beginning at the middle of the field is very, very bright and, your, and these little numbers represent foot candles. As you move away, um, it gets darker and darker and your foot candles reduce. We are at a point now where we do not trigger the threshold of 0.8 foot candles at any residential structure in the area. So the lighting design. The, um, the other issue that came up was the FAA required obstruction lights for um, most certainly the field lighting poles and potentially uh, the press box and elevator. 
Uh, that's a little up in the air because there's some room for massaging that a bit if you have uh, obstruction lighting within 150 feet of each other. So we may be able to eliminate the obstruction lighting on the press box and the elevator. But there will be obstruction lighting on the poles themselves. Um, contrary to what you may have read in some of the comments, uh, these are steady burning lights. They are not blinking lights. And they have the functional equivalent of about a 60 watt light bulb. And so in comparison to the light that's going to exist because of the stadium field lighting, we were able to determine that those obstruction lights would result in a less than significant impact in combination with the other um, field lighting. And then a representative example is in that bottom picture, you can see the little red light at the top of the pole. That's a similar size um, FAA obstruction lighting located in Point Loma. One of the other issues that um, commenters um, were concerned about was that the addition of um, field lighting in their community would create um, sky glow and other light trespass effects and that the neighborhood surrounding the facility was predominantly dark and wasn't characterized by the sky glow and other sort of light trespass effects from in a typical urban environment. The comments kind of, uh, we use the word conflated, but I think, I don't want to say misunderstood, but sky glow is more of a regional type impact, and so you look at the impact on a, a broader basis than a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. And because of that, we were able to conclude that the impacts to sky glow would be less than significant. Uh, and that was really not dependent on the lighting design, not so much as the light trespass effects. The other concern was that we had used the wrong technical analysis for the, to determine whether or not it was an urbanized environment. But our experts um, relied on a standard that is widely accepted and concluded that it was uh, an urban environment, an E3 environment. And we recognize that the Peninsula Community Plan itself defines the community as a highly urbanized area. So we think that we are consistent in that regard. The other issues where we saw a lot of comments was the impact to private views and some alleged visual character influences, primarily related to light poles and the press box and some related to the new three-story building. But principally, they affected private views. There are no established public view corridors in this area that would be affected by this project. And so we were able to conclude that there would be no significant impacts for these areas. Although there are, it's a, for CEQA purposes, there are no significant impacts, but we recognize that there will be impacts to views in terms of individual views, they may see the the 70 foot light poles, but because they are primarily shielded between the buildings and they're on the interior track surface now, um, we believe that those effects would will be nominal um, given the distance from the poles to the edge of the campus. Um, it raises another issue, though, that we had to address, and that is when we redesigned the lighting we ended up moving the lighting closer to the field so that we could reduce the amount of lights required. This created a potential conflict with the pole vault and long jump areas because they would have then been located too close to the lighting and we wouldn't have had sufficient area for the athletes to maneuver safely. So this came up pretty late in the process um, and we had to redesign those areas for student safety and we incorporated into our project description those elements that were being redesigned. Technically we didn't have to do that but we wanted to make sure that the public was fully aware of all components of the project and that you know it, it was a result of the field lighting so we wanted to make sure that we captured it in the EIR. <laughs> We had a lot of public comments on noise. Um, a lot of the noise comments 
are are historical and anecdotal based on prior operations of the field. Um, as the board is aware and the public, there has been field lighting and a PA system in use at Point Loma High School for at least the homecoming game. And it's primarily related to those night games at homecoming that people expressed um, strong concern about the noise impacts to their residences. And noise is a very difficult item to address because you have issues related to, the only way to really capture the sound is to enclose it. And that would not be a feasible way of reducing sound impacts in Point Loma. Uh, it would be aesthetically um, unpleasing and it would be prohibitively expensive. So we did look at other ways of mitigating it. They're fully discussed in the EIR. Uh, everything from sinking the stadium to building walls around the stadium to, in response to a comment, looking at replacing windows and installing air conditioning in private homes. Um, all of those we determined, while um, conceivable, were not feasible for purposes of CEQA. Another issue we had was parking. As most people are aware, um, the campus is underparked currently. And so any sort of use that you bring to the campus is only going to exacerbate that situation. Part of the master planning process looked at whether or not it would be feasible to construct um, several or one parking structure and determined that it really wouldn't be feasible because of the ingress and egress and the fact that you wouldn't be able to accomplish as many campus-wide improvements if you were to construct a parking structure. What we were able to determine and what changed a lot between the draft EIR and the final EIR is we really dug into the phasing. I have to say Barbara Heyman, our CEQA consultant, did a fantastic job of this, of basically overlaying all the different phases of the construction and identifying both parking on-site and off-site that could be used to make sure that we didn't have any significant impacts during construction. Um, we were able to do that. What we weren't able to do was to eliminate parking and traffic impacts um, when there was a high capacity event. And to be clear, we actually have enough parking uh, to park on site and using available street parking. The counts were actually done and there is a surplus. But there is a finite number of parking spaces on the street and at any given time residents may be using more or less of those. And so for part of our mitigation, we identified the available parking lots at uh, Correa and Dana as and, and Loma Portal Elementary Schools to provide additional capacity should it be needed. And the mitigation measure ask that the principals of those schools coordinate to make sure that there are no conflicts in events. So this pretty much lays out our revised um, traffic mitigation. And as you can see, it's, it's a little more involved than just placing signs and sending flyers home. We actually anticipate having personnel out there helping to direct people to parking. We think that one of the um, indirect effects will that, of that will be to reduce some of the traffic congestion as the people are arriving and departing from the games. Insofar as alternatives, uh, there were some suggestions that we could use Correa Middle School as an alternative to building out the athletic facilities there because we have installed um, new athletic facilities are, are installing at Correa. However, um, you kind of see from this graphic that the facilities at Korea Middle School simply can't accommodate a high school team's practices and uses without interfering with Korea Middle School's use of its facilities. And when we talk about whether or not it's feasible mitigation for the noise and traffic impacts, CEQA requires you to look at whether or not it will reduce an impact. And in this case, it wouldn't reduce the impacts to relocate to Korea. It would just shift those same impacts to a different community, subset of the community. Um, 
And so it really isn't um, a feasible alternative. More about mitigation. A lot of the comments relate to the operational impacts and expectations of both the public and the district in the use of this field. As I mentioned earlier, we did a very conservative analysis. That conservative analysis kicked off in how we described the project, followed up by the analysis that we did and the baselines that we chose to analyze the impacts. For purposes of this EIR, we used, uh, if you want to look at traffic, we lose, used a Saturday morning to establish the baseline. Um, we analyzed noise from a very similar perspective. Um, all of this kind of overemphasizes the impacts of a project, but it makes sure that you've identified and mitigated to the extent feasible those impacts. I'm going to touch on Lee's favorite subject, um, <laughs> the Point Loma field use policy. We were very deliberate in not tying the EIR to the Point Loma field use policy. Um, although the policy prioritizes uses and it limits uses to 18 per year, it limits operation of the sound system, we recognize through the process of the EIR that the frequency of events has nothing to do with their significant impact as determined by CEQA. And so we, we said because it doesn't really act to mitigate any of the significant effects, we're not going to rely on that in our analysis to determine the feasibility of alternative mitigations. What we've done instead is um, we've looked at portions of the field use policy and kind of tied them to other policies and procedures within the district. For example, the field use policy limits noise makers, but it really ties it to CIF events. But the district has another administrative procedure, 6230, that governs the conduct of student and adult spectators at, the, at athletic events that more specifically prohibits noisemakers. And even though this wouldn't mitigate um, any significant environmental impact, it is important to note that there are procedures within the district that are operationally expected of spectators, both adults and students, attending our athletic events. And again, it really, um, the frequency relates more towards how disruptive it is to people in their homes rather than whether or not it constitutes a significant impact under CEQA. And district staff and the consultants recognize that it is intrusive to have noise on an even semi-regular event. But we have been careful in this uh, analysis to ensure that while the Point Loma field use policy is not a mitigation measure, it is fully incorporated within the EIR and we recognize that third party use of our fields um, would be subject to the existing policies and procedures and is frankly limited to athletic groups. Um, we did that in the project objectives. So I think that the, many of the concerns have been addressed through the response to comments, but of course we're always available to to answer any other questions that the public or the board may have in terms of how this process evolved and how we got to where we are today with the final EIR. Um, we will be asking that the board adopt a resolution certifying the final EIR, adopting a mitigation monitoring reporting program, adopting findings of fact, a statement of overriding considerations where the board will weigh the benefits of the project against the significant and unavoidable effects to noise and traffic and approving the whole site modernization and athletic facilities upgrade project. Thank you. Come right. Right. So we'll, President McQuarrie, I'll move staff recommendation. So we want to hear public comment? No, I'll move it. I'll second it. Okay, got it. So it's been moved and seconded, except staff recommendation. I will uh, have public comment. Uh, we have uh, 20 uh, speakers in support, and we have 13 opposed. Uh, and so we will uh, go in groups of 10, uh, doing uh, 10 support and, uh, I mean, sorry, five groups of five, five support, 
followed by five opposed, and then alternating back to support opposed until we've gone through the, um, the 20 support and the 13 opposed. So, um, so as mentioned earlier, uh, we'll have a, um, focus your comments more on the final. Uh, please don't be repetitive. Uh, stay with the facts and the issues. Absolutely focus on clarity. Our effort here is to pursue the truth, uh, to be fair, uh, to create understanding, and then to give the board the opportunity to arrive at a solution that'll be beneficial, uh, most beneficial to everyone involved. So the uh, first group of speakers will be two minutes each. Uh, Christy Scadden, Kate Lubson, Angelica Wilson, Kyle Grady, Akina Peter, be followed by opposed, Frank Senka, Michelle Leff, <coughs> Alan Leff, Citizen, and Matt Schoenmacher. So we'll start with uh, Christy, Kate, Angelica, Kyle, and McKenna. Please. Hi, I'm Christy Scadden. Uh, I am a community member and I live near the field side uh, entrance for Pointe High Field. In addition to supporting general the general site modernization and the stadium upgrades, ensuring access is to all is vital. All improvements and scope of work should include universal access, meaning access to school, field, events, stands, etc., should not only comply with ADA law, but be designed so that students with disabilities are able to fully participate as part of their community. To, cl to clarify, this is beyond complying with ADA law. Instead, look how a school is used operationally. For example, the ADA compliant elevator at Lincoln versus a universally designed campus. Lincoln is a beautiful campus, but an entire class of student using wheelchairs cannot independently get to the other side of campus unless an adult assists them. It's not functional. Consider this for the stands, the press box, the Voltaire field entrance being open for school and for school and for school events so all students and their families living on the south side of the school can access it safely. Also taxpayer money is wasted when we have to correct it after the fact. Thank you. We have Kate. Hi. I'm Kate Lubson, a Loma Portal homeowner and mom to five future pointers, two of them here. And I'm a founder of Progress for Point Loma High School, support your neighborhood signs. Community members support updates of Point Loma High and do not support any further neighborhood negativity to stall progress there. Lights are for the students, not for money. That fear is overblown. There won't be adequate field time available for rental after the school's needs are met. There just isn't enough time in the day or space left over. The bottom line is all children should have the opportunity to go to a good school and have access to the benefits that other schools have to offer. Point Loma High cannot stay the only high school in the district that does not have stadium lights. Our students deserve more than to be left in the dark by their community. Let's not fear the updates or let a small lobbying group stall the compromise solution any further. Do not leave students in the dark. Let there be light. Allow our pointers to shine. Thank you. So we have Angelica, Kyle, and McKenna. I'm going to let Kyle go first. Hey Kyle, you're on. All right. On deck. Okay. Hello board, my name is Kyle Grady. I'm a sophomore yeah. student athlete at Point Loma High School. Uh, and I think through all the technicalities of this issue, we forget to think about what the real uh, center of this issue is, is the students and the impact lights and the whole modernization program has on uh, current Point Loma students and future Point Loma students. Uh, 
since I was a kid, I've always had this dream of having the whole Friday Night Light football experience, being able to play with my teammates and play for my family and friends. But without the lights, we can't do either of those. Uh, my family and friends, they're either at other sports practices, at work, have other issues that um, they can't attend our games. Um, and I just feel like the support of our community and the camaraderie of uh, all, all our friends and family is uh, a big advantage. And I think that we lose the advantage. Uh, all other schools in the district have access to lighting except for Point Loma High School. Uh, I feel like that's a disadvantage to us, not only uh, from a football standpoint, but uh, all Point Loma athletics. Uh, so I feel like this is an issue that really needs to be taken care of. Thank you. Your name? McKenna Peter. Hey. Good evening, Board President, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Martin. My name is McKenna Peter, and I am a current junior at Point Loma High School. At Point Loma High School, we have what we call seventh period athletics. Essentially, the purposes of, the, of this implementation is to disperse our athletes' practice times to accommodate for our lack of field space and daylight hours. Today I speak for not only myself, but for the 700 other student athletes at Point Loma High School who are forced to sacrifice an entire hour of academic time each day in order to pursue athletics. It has become quite evident that many arguments persist regarding what is best for this topic. But there is one question that should make the ultimate decision, and that is what is best for the students. By prohibiting Point Loma High School from making the necessary full field renovations, we are forcing student athletes to choose between athletics and academics. This clearly is not in the student's best interest. This should not be a decision us student athletes must make. Extracurricular activities should be both accessible and encouraged to all students, not made difficult to partake in by infrastructural deterrence. We are currently sending the wrong message that you cannot be both an academic scholar and an outstanding athlete, when in fact, with the right accommodations, you can. I speak today not for myself, as for when these improvements are completed, I'll have graduated and be on to the next journey of my life. I instead stand here today for the future pointers to ensure that when the day comes that they too get to walk the halls of high school, they won't have to sacrifice their academic interests as I and many others have. Thank you. Kyle, and then followed by Frank, Michelle, Allen, Citizen, and Matt. Yes. I'm Angelica. <laughs> I had I let Kyle speak in um, in front of me. I got it. Okay. Um, good evening, Superintendent Martin, Board Trustees, and Board President McCrary. My name is Angelica Wilson, and I am a parent of two Point Loma High students, a junior and a freshman. I would like to speak briefly on the approval of the final EIR for the site modernization plan at Point Loma High. I would like to ask that we all, on both sides of the issue, remember that this isn't just about stadium lights and stadium improvements. Although as a mom of a marching band student and an athlete, I see the advantages these improvements would allow, like giving our marching band the ability to practice on the same field that they compete. Currently they have one practice over the entire marching season on a Saturday that they're able to use the football field. This is a PLHS site modernization plan. These improvements would help make our campus more accessible to students with disabilities and make our school safer by allowing us to fully limit the access to campus during school hours. I know that it is this board's intention to make neighborhood schools great so that parents will choose to send their children to neighborhood schools instead of private schools. And at Point Loma High, we're starting to accomplish that with next year's incoming freshman class having a higher number of students returning from private schools to their public high school because of the amazing programs that we have. All we are asking is that Point Loma High students All we are asking is that Point Loma High students have the same advantages as all other high school students in the district. I urge you to vote in favor of the final EIR and the much needed improvements to our campus. Thank you. So we'll now hear from uh, those opposed, Frank, Michelle, Allen, Citizen, and Matt, and then we will rotate back to the five in support. And you are... Good evening, Frank Cuenca, uh, resident next Point Loma High School since 1978. Um, 
to keep this factual and on, on point, if you have access to the uh, final EIR volume one, if you can pull that up, I'm gonna actually refer to a specific section. And I'm gonna paraphrase parts, but I think it'd be better if you could see it visually. <coughs> So it's just not me talking, but you actually can see it, right? Always the best thing. <clears throat> so if you look at uh, Exhibit F in Volume 1, F is in Frank, please. There's reference there to a Benya Burnett Consultants Analysis of Addendum to the Lighting Impact Study in PLHSDEIR by James uh, F. Benya. Everybody got that up? Can you see it on your, on your screen? Is that a yes or no? Got two minutes, so you should. Mr. Uh, Benya provides expert uh, testimony as a professional engineer and a fellow of the Illuminating Engineering Society, also a fellow of the International Association of Lighting Designers. He's also a principal consultant to the California Energy Commission. The new lighting system, and this is, I quote him, will still produce 3.7 million environmental lumens. This is the same amount of light as produced by about 500 of San Diego's induction, induction lamp street lights, enough to light over 14 miles of typical city streets. It is the applicant's responsibility to respond to secret cr criteria to determine whether the proposed new lighting system causes an environmental impact and to what extent. To do this, the applicant relied upon standards developed by the Institute of Lighting Engineers, ILE, in, two, in the year 2000, and the Electric Power Research Institute, and used calculations submitted by the contractor in Musco that sold them the lights. Kind of a conflict of interest. We have a significant reservation about Appendix B2, especially the process and standard used in reaching its conclusion, and offer the following comments. Your time is up. Thank you. Next. Nothing like the truth, right? But you can submit your comments. You've already submitted, thanks. My name is Michelle Leff. I live across from the stadium, and I'm also the mother of a future pointer. I'm going to focus my comments on the parking surveys that were performed. A few of the issues, um, the study that was looking at available free parking spaces says that it was performed during a homecoming football game. However, when you look at the actual Appendix M of the parking study, half of the street segments were surveyed on June of 2013. That would be a summer. Also, the numbers that were used were taken between 5 and 6 p.m. on Friday when the football game started at 6.30. This would also be before the majority of residents would have returned from work. So had the survey been done at uh, actual time during a game or when residents would be home, the number of available parking spaces on the street would be much lower. The one of the mitigation measures is that people will park at other school properties. Dana and Cray are the ones that are listed. It is said in the final EIR that that is within one third to one half of a mile. That is incorrect. Dana is 0.6 miles from the stadium and Correa is over one mile from the stadium. Also, it does not take into account the walkability of this. There is a 5% grade on Valletta that you would have to come down from Correa and there is a 7% grade on Voltaire that you would have to come up from either of those other schools. Also, the Correa uh, parking lot is currently used by the YMCA. Um, are they going to no longer be allowed to use those parking spaces because we're going to save them for the games? It also says that half of the students living within a half mile radius of the school will walk, ride their bike, or take the bus to these events. The map that is um, submitted, Appendix G of that parking study, the half a mile that it says actually crosses over Correa, which we've already said is over a mile from the school. So the 304 students that they're counting in this area are further than a mile from the school. I have walked these streets at night after a football game is not a time I'm gonna want my future pointer walking home in the dark. Thank you. Alan and Citizen and Matt. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Alan Leff. I'm a retired police officer and a graduate from Point Loma High School. And I'd like to address uh, a couple of issues that I did not see in the EIR, but definitely hold an impact to the, uh, the neighborhood. And th that is um, simply 
As a police officer, I had numerous occasions to work these night athletic events. Principally, we were employed to do so for two reasons. One was adults behaving in ways that they typically wouldn't, usually involving alcohol. And the second reason, and nearest to my heart, is gang activity. Pretty much all of the night games have some component of that, and as you may or may not know, this very board in 1971 halted all night athletic games because of the gang activity associated with them. I think what, what differentiates Point Loma High School from all of the other schools that you administer is that there is no separation with the community and for all intents and purposes, no parking. So this project would then force all of the spectators and all of the participants to park in front of the streets on our homes. In all of your other schools, this isn't such a problem because the spectators and the participants drive onto campus, attend the event, drive off campus, very minimal impact to the neighborhood. I think you can see the potential for the problems that we are going to have with people walking through our neighborhood after games in the dark after their brothers and sisters have lost a game. The potential there, I think you will see, our neighborhood will see a dramatic increase in property crimes. We will see an increase in vehicle thefts, vehicle burglaries, burglaries, assaults, all of this associated with the night games. Thank you. You, you have with this, with this decision, you have the opportunity to introduce a problem into a neighborhood that currently does not exist. You've made your or point. Or to not do that. Thank you. Citizen followed by Matt. Taxpayers, home, homeowners, gave you millions and millions of dollars for projects like this and you don't have the right to impact the quality of the life of those neighborhoods. And you have to be very, very careful before you approve something like this. You didn't do it uh, with the Hoover High School project. You didn't do it with Claremont. And now you're going to impose a project like this in Scripps Ranch. So when people look at you and say, we don't trust you when you say you're not gonna be renting the facilities out to commercial enterprises, Nobody believes you because you guys are always in a budget deficit and you will do whatever you can do to generate money and that includes using these school facilities as much and as often as you can despite tearing up the facilities that we keep paying for. And another concern is homeowners are going to be hit hard with property taxes when there is that balloon payment on our homeowner taxes and people don't know that. But in return, what we get for giving you millions and millions and millions of dollars are projects like this which impact our neighborhoods to an extent that no one could have ever expected. Not once have you guys made a good decision because in the end, you're getting complaints and more complaints from the, the neighborhoods that you've already impacted. And I predict that's going to happen with Point Loma. You're going to impact the quality of the life of this neighborhood after you receive the generosity from us to pay these property taxes and pay the, the debt that we're gonna pay. And you didn't consider the neighborhoods. And that's the first thing that you need to do is you need to consider the neighborhoods because those are the people that are paying these taxes for you. And nobody believes you when you say it's gonna be limited to 18 events because that's not what happens. Yeah. Hi, my name is Matt Schoonmaker, and if anyone here has stood on the football field at Point Loma High School, then you've seen my house. Can you lift the microphone a bit? You're speaking over it. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, did you hear? Yes, that's much better. I remember playing high school sports under the lights, but I also remember no nearby houses. What I oppose is the renting of the field for lighted events in the evenings. The field use policy sounds great, but my understanding is it is not enforceable and it can be changed. The best intentions are great, but not following the field use policy will greatly impact my wife and my quality of life. The final environmental impact report 
states that noise and traffic are significant and unavoidable impacts. Who does the noise and traffic impact? Me, my wife, my neighbors, and my community. The people who are benefiting the most from this project, who I want to support, don't have to suffer those noise and traffic. In order to, uh, just to be clear, the board, you are determining that the benefits to the school and students outweigh the cost that me, my wife, and my neighbors will have to pay. You might say, what's the big deal? Well, these impacts are, quote, significant. Well, why don't you do something about it? Well, these are, quote, unavoidable. What am I supposed to do if the field starts being rented out? The noise and traffic are significant and unavoidable, and the field use policy is good, but needs to be enforceable. If we are bearing these costs, the very least is to be able to enforceably limit them. Let us find a better compromise than the current plan. And I have a little time left. <laughs> um, so I didn't. Um, <laughs> thank you. Well done. So um, we'll have uh, a 10 and 10 again, starting with Aiden and Yakley, Lily Lutz, Lisa Regolia, Anna Regolia, Alex Van Hueven. Um, fall, and then the 10 opposed following them would be Anna Fotheringham, Featheringham, Kathy Pratt, Jeff, oh yeah, I skipped, uh, Joyce Peterson, Cynthia Snyder, then Anna, uh, then Kathy, and then uh, Jeff. So we'll start. Uh, with uh, Aiden, if I say, Aiden, if I said your name right. Hi, I'm Aiden Yackley, and I'm a junior at Point Loma High School, and I play for both the soccer and baseball teams at the varsity level. And one thing that I want to talk about is the access to the field that certain players have. Um, one huge problem that we have is being able to share the field at different times, and what that leads to is teams having practices canceled and games being rescheduled and all that. And one thing that we'll find is that because we don't have the equal access and the use to the field is that safety becomes an issue to a lot of the players because we don't get to practice, we don't have the preparation for certain games, and we'll find that a lot of kids are have a great increase in injury. You can just ask the athletic training facilities at our school, and they'll see huge numbers of kids coming into the facilities because of injuries and all and certain related issues and that's become a big issue for us thank you thank you Lily Lisa and Anna hi I'm Lily Lutz I am a junior at Point Loma High School and I participate in the soccer women's soccer program and I wanted to address that um, a majority of the Point Loma High School parents work full-time jobs and due to our limited facilities it makes it nearly impossible for them to come out and support their kids without having to take time out of their work um, in some cases parents haven't seen their children play a single game at Point Loma High School during their entire athletic careers which to me is a big deal because they are a big part of our community as well. Um, not only are our parents having limited access, but also student athletes and peers are not being able to come and support each other um, due to having other practices or commitments at the same time. Um, this prevents us as a school from uniting and also from having a community full of school spirit and support which benefits the students in the community as a whole. Please support Point Loma High School. Thank you. Hello. Lisa. Hello, my name is Lisa Regula and I want to thank you all for hearing from us today. I am a current senior graduating from Point Loma High School this year and will be attending Duke University this fall. And I'd like to say that Point Loma has given me a lot of amazing opportunities. Um, not only am I a basketball player and a lacrosse player, but I am also the drum major of our marching band. And uh, organizations like our marching band, JROTC, cheer, dance, and JV sports will be significantly aided if we f proceed with this full site modernization, specifically modernizing the fields. Um, to elaborate on this, 
for marching band specifically, as a drum major, I've had to come out with using the flashlight on my phone to conduct people from a podium. They can't see my face and I can't see theirs. All they can see is the little light shining up and down into the sides. And this is what we get because we have to use the field after hours because there's not simply, there's literally not enough time in the day. Um, by moving forward and getting lights on the field um, it's, and being used by the way the policies have light out, we have practices that begin during the days and we would simply need a little bit of light for those last few practices at the end of the year to utilize the football field and not put us at a competitive disadvantage during our marching season. This full site modernization is not just for the athletes, it's for every single student at Point Loma High School. The extracurriculars that I have participated in are the reason why I'm going to be able to go out into the world and be in a established, helpful, and um, intricate part of my community. And I hope that by moving forward with this, more students in the future will get opportunities even better than the ones that I have. I'm proud of my school, and I hope that you guys will continue to help support us become the people that we wish to become. Thank you. Thank you guys for having us here. Um, I'm Anna Regula, a junior this year at Point Loma. That was my older sister, Lisa. Um, a major part of this is academics. We're a school that's very focused, and many of the student speakers here tonight are some of the best and top in our classes. And academics is extremely important to us as long with sports. Um, as we said earlier, we have seventh, seventh period athletics and some students don't even have seventh period athletic classes. We are forced, for example, me, I'm forced to miss uh, up to two, maybe even three classes every time that we have a home game, which is quite often, considering I also play lacrosse and I'm in marching band, so I miss a lot of class for that, which is really important that we don't do that. This also really affects students from other schools. They have to leave every time we have a home game and they have to come. They have to leave so many periods early and they're missing so much academic time in the classroom. That's vital to their grades and what they're learning. And if our focus is really on academics, then we need to make sure that we're able to stay for every period of the day and learn all that we can. And then we can go play athletics and learn even more. Tonight, a few of us wore our CIF rings because we're very proud of them. And there's something that show that we can juggle academics and uh, we can juggle academics and our time on the field, but we really need help with it because right now it's, it's extremely difficult to juggle it all. And without these upgrades, we, we won't be able to continue to do it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alex Van Heuven. I'm the athletic director at The Point Loma High School. I wanna thank you for letting me speak and letting the students speak today. The lack of lights at Paloma High School endangers the well-being of our student athletes. For the purpose of safety, a minimum amount of hours of full contact, full speed, and full field practices are required before competition. These practice hours prepare the student athlete body for the demands and rigor of high impact contests. Students at Point Loma High School are denied the space and time required to safely prepare for the physical demands of these athletic competitions, putting our students' safety at risk. Currently, we're required to share spaces during practice and cancel practices altogether when we host any event on the main tracker field. These lost practice hours have and will continue to result in extremely serious injuries such as concussions, muscle strains, broken bones, and severe injuries requiring surgery. If you think about it, this is like crash testing a car without ever putting it on the highway. It is our duty to use practice hours as a preparation for safety and a tool to prevent injury. As athletic director, I'm presented with countless complaints and concerns, many of them having no clear-cut right or wrong answer. So I frequently ask myself resorting to the same internal question over and over time and time again. The question is straightforward and I believe helps me to be good at my job. That question is what is best for the students. It seems simple, but is the core intention and purpose of our jobs to primarily advocate for the students at all times, in all situations. There are countless issues being addressed at this meeting regarding the proposed whole site modernization at PLHS, but these issues seem to be more and more about politics and less about the school and the students. All we really need to focus on is what is best for the kids. We have to consider what will give the students more time and space for extracurricular activities. We have to identify what will give the students, both home and visiting teams, more academic time. 
What will give the students the opportunity to be watched and cheered on by their parents with full-time jobs? And what will give all students, including band, cheer, and ROTC, equal access to the facilities at PLHS? On this agenda item, I respectfully request that the board and the superintendent ask themselves the only question that matters, what is best for the kids? We have Joy, uh, Joyce Peterson, Cynth uh, uh, sorry, uh, Joyce Peterson, Cynthia Snyder, Anna, Kathy, and Jeff for this round, please. Most of my questions have been answered by the, um, the team this evening, so I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. I just have a couple questions that you might consider as you move forward. One is um, whether there could be some noise mitigation by not using aluminum bleachers, if there would be an option to that. Another issue would be what is the height of the light poles that the FAA would allow that would not require a red light on the top. So those are just still some of my concerns. Thank okay. you. Cynthia? I'm Ann. Um, fathering him. You're, I'm sorry, you're Anna? And fathering him. You're Ann, okay, thank you. Okay. I am a graduate of Point Loma High School. The sound and lighting equipment systems and bleacher configuration proposed for Point Loma High School is massively greater than those at La Jolla High School. The La Jolla High School athletic field configuration historically, over decades, clearly demonstrates that a successful athletic program, including football and band, can be run on a field configuration that has less environmental impact than the plan currently proposed for Point Loma Athletic Field. At La Jolla High, San Diego Unified District itself has thereby proven that it is not necessary to have 70 foot tall lights on a high school athletic field, nor 60 foot tall speaker poles. I put on record that I contend that in its final report, San Diego Unified School District's board has not adequately responded uh, to the questions posed by residents of the homes and individuals of the community in regard to light, sound, spillage, traffic. I believe that the proposed scale of change to the athletic field is exponentially greater than necessary. The school has increased the number of sports, but it has not added additional fields. It expects one field to handle all of those additional sports and activities. You increase the number of events, but you do not add a parking lot. I note also that architecturally, the picture presented tonight, which I've seen for the very first time, was not drawn in scale that is not showing a 70 foot light to scale with the bleachers. I do not believe that you are adequately thinking about the types of activities that you expect to have on one field and only one field. Thank you, Anna. Hi, my name is Cynthia, Cynthia. and um, I've written to you, so if you are interested in the content of what I have to say, it's in the notes that I've submitted to you. Um, here, I'm just sort of responding to some of the things that I've heard tonight from the students and from some of the other people. I thought it was really interesting and cute that the students from Cumbria were talking about um, what they thought were things they should do, and one of them was prioritize. Um, <coughs> I think that the priorities of this, that this district has shown in putting an emphasis on athletic fields throughout its district is completely wrongheaded. I think it's very nice that the students have come out, but I note that they're all athletes. And I'm wondering if Point Loma High School is only athletes. Um, I'm wondering to what extent, where is the music, where are the orchestra members? I see the marching band, I love the marching band. I'm wondering that if they can't access the field, why is Pee Wee football using it on Saturdays? This is the policy that we are supposed to trust is going to keep this prioritization for Point Loma High School students. It is already failing. Everything else I have to say is written to you and I just wanted to, these are for you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Jeff? Uh, 
Hi, I'm Jeff. I'm a future parent of a pointer. And uh, I guess what's getting lost in this perhaps is that the purpose of school and high school is education. It's not athletics or entertainment. And it's really shocking to me to hear that students are sacrificing their school time to go for sports. That's certainly something I would not let my children do. Um, in this time where we're always having budget crises and having to pass bonds to go into debt to finance schools, I think every last dollar should be spent in the classroom on students and on teachers to have the best ones we can get. And I don't have a problem with updating the school. The only problem I have is with the uh, athletic fields and it just happens to be all lumped together. Um, the other thing that I'd comment on is I think it's rather unfortunate that this process seems to follow the cynicism of a lot of politics whereby there's a schedule for construction before the project's even approved yet. And we've kind of made this a wedge issue among communities, creating almost like a civil war atmosphere where I don't think the people that are opposed to Qualcomm like stadium lights are anti-student or anti-athletics. But the, the real... <laughs> So the real focus ought to be on education. Point Loma High School has not had these measures since its existence, and I don't think all the alumni classes up till now have had a, a horrendous experience in their high school. And high school is a very short time, but if you live in a home around here, that's your life before high school and after, and that's generations long potentially. So while all these experiences are over within a couple years, the people around here are gonna have to pay the price for much longer. Jeff. Starting the next round of uh, support, uh, followed by opposed. Uh, with support, uh, Elaine Burrell, Grant Strom, Jarrett LaRocco, La Roca, Travis Choi, and Eva Scavejo. Followed uh, on the opposed, we'll do uh, Brookway Clark, Bob Otali, Otali and Linda Lloyd. So we'll start with Elaine, Grant, Jarrett, Travis, and Eva. Good evening, my name is Elaine Burrell and I'm a homeowner and um, I'm a homeowner in Loma Portal and a parent of three future pointers aged 13, eight, and eight. I'm also a founding member of Progress for Point Loma High School. Signs, please. <laughs> Um, a group of us formed Progress for Point Loma because there was a lot of negativity circulating in our neighborhood from an opposing group. Um, and we didn't want to sit back and, and engage in negative quarrels with our neighbors, um, people who are here tonight, who I, whose opinions I respect, and who are friends of mine, and who I attend church with, and who I uh, walk my dog with. We need to live in harmony and uh, despite our differences. And so our group decided to um, model to our children how to uh, stand up for what we believe in and what we feel is right for the students while respecting our neighbor's opinions and the concerns that are raised. So by doing that, we attended all the community meetings. We had respectful conversations about the lights with our neighbors. We remained informed about the decisions and engaged in the field process of developing the field use agreement, which is an essential part of the resolution to this issue. Tonight, you have before you the best possible compromise for our community. The time has come now for a resolution for our neighborhood. At this moment, we have a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate to our children the power of involvement and compromise. Your leadership is needed now. Show our children that efforts to compromise are never wasted. Ratify the final EIR and enforce the field use agreement. Thank you. Jeff Grant, Jarrett Travison. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Jarrett LaRocco, and I'm currently a senior at Point Loma. I'm here tonight to discuss why it is my dream to see site modernization 
and stadium reconstruction on my campus. If you direct your attention to the paper I just passed out, you'll see two pictures, both capturing what's truly like to be a student of Point Loma, where it's all about community. Um, the top photo was actually taken during our annual homecoming game this year, which is our only night sporting event on campus, like out of the gym. Um, if you look closely, you can spot alumni, parents, uh, perspective pointers, and uh, current students all throughout the crowd. This game was not only the highlight of my senior year, but also of all four years at Point Loma. Um, spending the night cheering with, on my school with all my friends and classmates and my um, community by my side. The bottom photo, photo was taken one week after um, to send to our vice principal, Mr. Gormley, for his birthday, who is currently um, out for medical reasons. This is another perfect representation of the Point Loma student body coming together. It, this is what happens at Point Loma. We all come together as a community, cheer on our teams, and make lasting memories. You may be asking yourself, this kid's graduating in a few weeks and won't be at the school next year. Why the heck would his opinion matter? Well, let me tell you. Um, being the 31st person in my family to graduate from Point Loma, I will be a pointer in three weeks. I will be a pointer in three weeks, three years, and 30 years. Um, as they say, once a pointer, always a pointer. Uh, this is why my peers and I support site modernization. Not so we can be rowdy, take up all the parking, and cause trouble like normal high school students. So we can create memories that will be cherished and remembered forever. High school's only four short years. Shouldn't we be able to create fun, safe, and educational memories? Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Jack. Hi, I would like to start off by thanking you all for letting us speak here today. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Travis Choi, a sophomore at Point Loma High School. Uh, speaking as an athlete, it's disappointing that friends and family are rarely able to come and support all of us in our sporting events and extracurriculars that are on the field. Uh, I play football and lacrosse, and without lights, our home games are always in the middle of the day when parents are at work and students are at extracurriculars or sporting events that, uh, sporting practices that they already have. Uh, the thing is, is that l having lights isn't a luxury, it is, it is a necessity. Personally speaking, without lights, lacrosse practices are constrained because not only do we have to share the field space with the girls team, but we also have to share it with track and field. Every other school doesn't have this problem because they have lights and so they have separate practice times and can practice into the evenings. Um, also, practices are a safety concern with track and field. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a pole vaulter get pelted by a lacrosse ball and let me tell you, that is not the most comfortable thing that easily causes injuries. And uh, yeah, um, uh, high school sports give students the feeling of belonging and team spirit. And unfortunately, this is something at Point Loma High that we are unable to have. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. I would like to thank the board for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm a junior at Point Loma High School, and, and I'm a please? student. I'm speaking uh, Grant Strom. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'd like to talk about the priorities as a student athlete, as all athletes at schools are students. Um, Point Loma athletics maintain a very high level of academics. I have maintained above a 4.0 GPA for the past three years while participating in two. <laughs> While participating in two uh, varsity sports um, all three years, um, going into my senior year, I have to look at my life and talk about um, priorities. And um, academics is always at the top, as for all the students are. Um, coaches, Coach Hastings, and all the other coaches in the room hold our students um, to a higher level academics-wise. Um, our football team holds a 2.5 GPA, even though the CIF is 2.0, and so there are many um, brothers that cannot play because they don't meet the grades, and we encourage each other to um, improve. So anyone in the room who believes that student athletes aren't also athletes, athletes, it's a student than the athlete. The athlete comes second, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, we have, um, I've got the speakers right. We're ready for uh, Brookway Clark, Bob Otella, Adley, thank you, and Linda Lloyd. Thank you. My name is Brockway Clark. 
Thank you. I'm a 48 year member of the Point Loma community, about seven blocks from the, the stadium as it exists now. The key features that are lacking in this EIR is a business plan. You get any MBA out at San Diego State, they need to develop a business plan and prove it and have it certified and they will be able to prove that they can be successful. We don't have a business plan here. When I've tried to talk to the, the uh, principal at Point Loma High School about a business plan, I got vague references to being a good big money maker. You're talking about spending millions of dollars for a sports facility. That's really neat and it would really be great for all of the students who are here tonight and all of the students in the future at Point Loma High School. But you need to develop the business plan and stick with it. And that way we can ensure that the impact that is certain to come with the proposal as presented on the community can be mitigated. We really are concerned about Point Loma High School being turned into a ghetto high school with the advent of unrestricted sports activities and unrestricted use of the sports facilities. Get a business plan and stick with it. Thank you. Yes. My name is Linda Lloyd. I'm a long-term resident of Loma Portal. I live near the high school. My family has enjoyed that proximity. We have been and continue to be supporters of our high school and its students. However, the unnecessary changes to the athletic field will inflict permanent damage to our Loma Portal neighborhood. The multi-million dollar price tag for these changes takes very limited funds away from much needed upgrades to the physical classroom building to make our high school a top-notch academic center of learning. For students who want better academics and who want a robust and uh, technology-based learning environment, the needs have been ignored and are placed into phases of projects that won't take place for years, well after they've graduated. I ask you to please take into consideration the focus on academics and the neighborhood uh, impacts. Do not proceed with the proposed changes to the athletic field based on a seriously flawed EIR process and a seriously flawed final EIR document. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my name is Bob Audley. I'm an attorney representing property owners and your neighbors adjacent to and near the high school. My comments are amplified in my letter of today's date with supporting documents which I have submitted for your record. My clients would request that you reject the proposal uh, here before you tonight or alternatively continue the matter to engage in further discussion with your neighbors to ensure that you proceed lawfully. In my view, you cannot lawfully do the improvements as currently proposed. As currently described, the proposed improvements violate, among other laws, San Diego's zoning and land use laws. Because the EIR in volume two, pages 1-21 to 1-23, identifies extensive non-academic commercial uses of the athletic field. You will not, let me emphasize that, you will not have benefit, as you have in other projects, of protections otherwise afforded academic uses under government code section 53094. Your own EIR has now created a factual record which dramatically distinguishes this project from the project that was litigated uh, all the way to the Fourth District Court of Appeals involving athletic facilities at Hoover High School. The Hoover project, as the court noted, specifically did not contemplate 
any non-academic uses. I believe the outcome of a Section 53094 claim will have a different outcome in litigation related to this project. I hope we can discuss this matter further in mediation, not in litigation. However, if state and local laws are violated by your adopted improvements, my clients intend to aggressively pursue enforcement of their rights under all applicable local and state laws. Thank you. So to final, final wrap up the speakers, uh, we have uh, Je uh, Justy Wilson Hembaugh, Sylvia Olivia Alvarez. Alvarez, Coach Mike Hastings, Matt Spathis, or we can call him back, and Doug Grady. My name is Justice Wilson Heimbaugh, and I am a junior at Point Loma High School, and also a member of our school's marching band, drumline, wind ensemble, and symphony orchestra groups, and I am not an athlete by any means. <laughs> it's not just the football players that benefit from the stadium lights. Every year, our marching band holds Rehearsathon, which is a rehearsal and fundraiser. It's the one guaranteed rehearsal we get on the football field, which is where we compete. It's 10 hours long. We are the only band in the district that isn't able to, or to con consistently practice on the field, so we are always at a disadvantage no matter how much we practice. But we make the most of our time by having a 10 hour long rehearsal. Without the lighting on the field, we have to schedule around sunset or provide our own lighting, which we do. Our parents park their cars against the fence that lines the football field and shine their headlights onto the field so that we can finish the last 45 minutes of our tiring rehearsal. We deserve better than that. I've given you a photo that was taken at approximately 6.30 p.m. in October of 2013, um, and it's showing our parents and their cars parked along the fence, giving us that little bit of extra light so we can finish our show and finish setting it so we can perform it two weeks later. Please vote to approve the final EIR. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia Alvarez. Um, I, the reasons for um, voting yes on this are pretty clear. It's about the students. As a parent of, of young men who played football, they had to leave school at 12.30 to go play at Point Loma. Nobody wanted to go play at three o'clock. The practice times, again, as a parent, I know are important for safety and fitness. And what's wrong with giving the kids lights? It's important, it's about the kids. It's a well-rounded high school education. To invoke fear and bring up uh, violence and crime from visiting teams is not only unfortunate, it's sad, and personally to me, it's, it's ugly. It's unnecessary. We're talking about visiting high school teams, players from all our schools. So give the kids their Friday night lights, thank you. Good evening. Very, Thank sorry. you. Yes. I just very quickly wanted to uh, point out that um, Sylvia Alvarez, who just spoke, um, earlier we had a, a discussion of the name change at Lee Elementary, and one of the names that, you know, that the students had been considering uh, was uh, Robert, Roberto Alvarez, um, who was a great um, uh, civil rights, uh, as a student, helped integrate the Lemon Grove schools and the Lemon Grove incident, which um, preceded, you know, the historic uh, integration of Central High School in Arkansas, and Roberto Alvarez is Sylvia Alvarez's oh. father, oh. and just wanted to point that out. Oh. All right, uh, 
Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Doug Grady, and uh, I'm in a unique position. I was a uh, pointer myself. I grew up in Point Loma, about three blocks from Point Loma High School. I have three kids that now are either have gone or will go to or are in Point Loma High School. I'm the pointer football president for the boosters, and I'm a uh, business owner in the community. So I have a lot of knowledge about this place. And besides the reports and the lawyers and all those things, I think it's unfortunate that we're looking at this as a divisive thing between the neighborhood. This isn't just about the students. This is about the whole community. And to me, the community was built on this high school. I've lived here my whole life. I, go to I went to school with people that have kids in the school. This is a community, a small town and a big city is what I like to call it. And by dividing the, the uh, community the way it is, it's, it's really taken away from what this could be. And if you've ever been to the homecoming night where we actually have lights, which I've driven in and out myself, uh, <laughs> it's an amazing night. It's a community night. It's a night that brings everybody together. And it's the night that I would bring my kids when they were young to see what it's like to be a pointer. It's a place that would really build the community. So the fact that we are fighting over something that is really for the kids and really for the community uh, is unfortunate. And I really ask that you approve the lights tonight and move forward instead of backwards. Thank you. Hello, board, superintendent, and staff. My name is Matt Spathis, and I'm a community member of Point Loma, past president at Point Loma Cluster Schools Foundation, and I used to have hair, a parent of four students that graduated from Point Loma High School. <laughs> Tonight, I just wanted to address a little bit about the process that our community undertook. I got called to action. It's been over three years. I was just looking three and a half years ago when I had friends, good friends, on both sides of this issue that were driving divisive stakes in our community and felt like I could try to help facilitate the conversation to deal with a situation where we've got a field that needs and a school that needs more activity time for students and neighborhood that is concerned. So how do we bridge the gap between neighborhood concerns and school needs and to create a policy that's not only good for students, but it's considerate and fair to the community. So with that spirit in mind, we formed an ad hoc committee of 24 members of, of, of folks that were on both sides of this issue, folks that were passionately against the lights, uh, folks that were indifferent, and folks that were passionately for the lights. To that end, our conversations were not around to be fair, whether lights should be at Point Loma, but were focused on a fair policy for the community if lights were at Point Loma. Our, our committee consisted of staff, community members, and uh, district folks as well. Um, we had four committee meetings and one all community meeting ranging. It's, it's been over three and a half years. October 2013 is when this process started. We came up with concerns around a framework that would develop a field policy that was personal to Point Loma but scalable to San Diego Union. Unified. The framework consisted of some guiding principles, a field use impact on resi our residential community, defining what that meant, categories of defining events from low impact to high impact events, considerations for those events, and policy and procedures and days of use for those events. So with that, I just want to say that I think our community, regardless of which side of the issue you stood on, worked collaboratively to hopefully do something that will meet the needs of the community district. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, so Matt, Matt Spathis, we may have some questions later, so please, regarding that, because that's a very important issue for us to make sure that we have a field use policy, and, and, and we want to make sure we understand and, and are, are using that operationally correct as was intended by the community. So we may ask you some questions later. Yes, How you doing? I'm Coach Mike Hastings, head football coach, and I've been a teacher at Point Loma High School for 22 years. Uh, I'm proud to say I'm a pointer for life. Uh, there was a man, Don Giddings, who was the head football coach in 1950. That's when the stadium was built. Uh, I like to say it's the house that Benny built, but it really was built before Coach Edens. And if anybody knows Coach Edens, he was the head football coach for 42 years at Point Loma High School. I was blessed to be named the head coach in 1998. Uh, and I got to work under Coach Edens from 1994 to 1998 to learn how to teach young men, how to teach them character, to teach them life skills and values. So please do not tell me that that football field is not a classroom. That is my classroom. 
and, and I'm proud to say that. Okay. I have loved and cared for these kids, not just the football players, but every student who's been in my classes. Uh, and I've taught inside, I've taught AP government, US history. In the last several years, I've taught physical education. And on that field, every day I teach life values, I teach life skills, and I teach kids how to properly play sports, okay? We need lights, we do need these lights. I am also a community member. I live less than seven blocks from this school. I am a foundation member of this community. I I love our community. I love everybody who lives in our community because I am one of them. When I go pick up my apples and oranges at Stumps Market, I'm rubbing elbows with everybody in our community and I'm giving them high fives. When I run my dogs to the beach at Dog Beach every morning at 5.30, every person I walk past or I see, I give high fives to because I'm a community member. When I retire, I will live in the glow of those lights and I will bask in the glow of those lights because I know that we as a community have put those lights in for the betterment of our children and our children children's children, because our school is only 90 years old, guess what? It's going to be here a lot longer than we are, and it's going to benefit our community for generations to come. Thank you for hearing me today. hearing. Now we'll close the public hearing. Uh, um, cool. So, um, ready for, uh, so we've had the, uh, the presentation by the, uh, by staff. Uh, we heard uh, comments from the public and we'll now move to board deliberations and then to to action. So I want to start it off. Uh, so Vice President. Yeah, and I appreciate uh, President McCorry. Matt, would you mind uh, coming up again? I just wanted to ask you a couple more questions about the process. And I appreciate your continued leadership in the, uh, in the, in the Point Loma cluster uh, for so many years and in our district. So Matt, um, obviously, the process was about achieving compromise that looked out for the interests of the students and the community at the same time. Could you maybe identify a couple of key components of that compromise uh, that resulted from that process? Sure. I, I think there's a lot of concern around uh, limiting the use of the facility to high impact events. Uh, certainly lights, um, noise, and all the other impacts that you're hearing from folks that are very concerned about it. Um, that was a guiding principle and that, that led to the restriction of events. I can tell you that there's still concern uh, from the community that, um, that, that the policies could change. And I think the community is looking for uh, uh, as much as they can get to that policy not changing in the future. Yeah, thanks, thanks yeah. Matt. And, and I also, um, understand that as part of the policy, uh, twice a year the Point Loma cluster uh, will come together specifically to look at the implementation of the field use policy. Is that your understanding? That's right. It was important part of that to have community feedback from all from all stakeholders. Okay. Thank, thank you, Matt. Okay. Thank you, Matt. And what I'd like to do is maybe, because I, I do understand, um, you know, this issue of, I, I think the policy was uh, you know, a process that was well done, and I think the result uh, is, is, a, is a policy that people uh, uh, can uh, feel comfortable about. The question is, is the policy subject to change? Um, the policy is a policy approved by the school board and would have to be changed by the school board. Uh, you know, if there was, for instance, you know, in, if, if the school board was to decide to go from 18 to 20 or 30, uh, you know, uh, events, uh, that, that would require a board action. Um, and I think what's important is, I, I mean, I would certainly, um, you, you know, express that this board is very committed to this policy and understands the work that went in uh, to, to, uh, to achieving the policy. 
But I would propose, and I'll, and I'll ask um, maybe Kimberly uh, to, to address this. Um, the policy is backed up by administrative procedures. Um, and I, I would like to make sure that if at any point a future school board was to consider a change to the policy, that there would be adequate and appropriate notification to the Point Loma community prior to that uh, issue coming before the school board. So for instance, if the school board was to say that um, you know, prior to any uh, uh, posting of an agenda um, that would it include a consideration of a change in the policy that there would be two weeks notice and that, to, and that the community, uh, including residents uh, surrounding the school would be properly notified so they could come and have input into that process. It's hard for me to imagine any school board um, voting to change a policy that this community has worked so hard uh, to come together around. Um, but, but I think if a future school board was to consider that, it would need to have adequate, um, it would need to give adequate notice and it would need to adequately listen to the concerns of people in the community. So could we um, uh, amend our administrative procedures, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about notice uh, to school board meetings to make sure that there would be at least a two week notice before any consideration of any future school board uh, to a change in the field use policy around Point Loma High School? Um, we could amend Administrative Procedure 9229. There is this section that allows for the implementation and adoption of field use policies. Um, if you were to do that to provide additional notice, um, we would recommend that you look at identify an area around the campus, um, much like we do in other land use planning type context, providing either 10 or 14 day written notice to residents and property owners. Um, because sometimes they're different. And um, we could also open it up to other residents or property owners that submit to the district that they want to receive notice. Okay, we thank you. We've got a motion on the floor and I want us to be able to uh, discuss and, and make a decision on that motion, but I'd like to follow this motion if we uh, vote to approve the uh, staff recommendation tonight uh, with, with a motion that would allow for two week notice uh, prior to any change in the field use policy. Okay. Understood, yeah. Thank you for that conversation and that exchange. It, it addresses uh, one of the key issues that came out of my conversations uh, with individuals and groups uh, regarding uh, this, uh, this, this project. Another large issue that comes up is the concern that we're really out to make money. Uh, that we're out to commercialize this field, that it really is about of um, filling the, um, our, our uh, adding to our, our bank account. Do we, any comments on that? Can we clarify? And, and, and I know we, we, we went through it once in the presentation, but just to make sure that uh, it's been clearly presented and understood as to what the intent is for this project and, and, and what role uh, do we have and what role is there in terms of making it a, a a, a commercialized uh, function. So um, in, in having been a part of the development of the field use policy, um, the policy uh, was a compromise. The 18 events is really, you know, the, the, really the, the, the minimum what the school needs to, um, to complete most of its uh, sports schedule. So um, the only way that the 18 nighttime uses is the maximum number of uses allowed. So if there was a use by an outside group under say the Civic Center Act, that would count against the 18 and would preclude the students from actually having access to it. So um, it's hard to contemplate a, a situation where the needs of an outside group would outweigh the needs of the student, the students, and we would uh, enact that provision of the policy. Also, in order for um, a lighted uh, third-party use requires um, um, the um, consent of the superintendent, and so it would require under this policy, and, and it requires um, obviously requires special circumstances um, in order to for it to, that to reach the superintendent for for that type of decision. But we didn't want to completely exclude um, third-party use in that way because that would we we felt that there would be a conflict with the intent of the Civic Center Act.
Yes, Trustee Dr. Whitehurst Bay. Thank you for that. Um, I first of all want to thank everyone who's been involved in this process because it's very evident that it's <coughs> thorough. Uh, I served as, as the chair of the uh, Southeast Economic De Development Corporation for a number of years and I'm quite familiar with the EIRs and that whole process. So I want to compliment the folks involved in putting this together in its thoroughness and also thank the community for engaging in this process. Uh, as I looked at it, uh, this school was built uh, 91 years ago, I believe, and has been around a while with, you know, all the things associated with a high school. And um, the one guiding principle for me as an individual and as a board member and my commitment has been uh, what is best for students. And that's what I live by and that's what I believe in. And I just want to say that that includes a lot of different things and to hear uh, the students talk about the safety and having to put car lights up and all these other things, is, is, uh, it's rather disturbing um, in order to be able to see what they need to, to see to finish their activities. This is the only high school um, that has not come online with this and I, I think that we do them a disservice if we don't uh, move forward with this. And um, in terms of athletics being a part of, of life and school and so forth, I, I often think about uh, doctors, surgeons, when they have to stand for hours to surgically operate on someone. That's academic, they have to train, go to med school, etc. but they also have to be physically fit because they have to stand there operating on someone. So I would hope that we would keep as a central focus the fact that we want to do what's in the best interest of the children. That's not ignoring the community but it is saying that they have a valid point and we will do what we can do to mitigate these issues, but we want to keep in mind why we started down this pathway anyway. So those are my comments. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things we have wanted <clears throat> through Vision 2020 really is to have schools being an integral part of the neighborhood, a central part of the, the community. I think we've seen cases in the past when the school district might locate a, a building in a community and, and make decisions about what to do it and then the community just, just has to deal with it. I can't think of any community more than Point Loma that is, is so integrated with the school. I mean, it's such a long and, and rich history. And it's certainly a central part of the community when, when all the houses and everything are right next to the, the school. I mean, we have other uh, suburban type of communities where it's a little bit separated from the rest of the community because of all the space and so forth. But I do think this, this has been a, a really thorough process and, and it's been, there's been a lot of commitment on the part of the community and part of the school district to, to really work on this. And I think this participation by both sides has, has to, to my opinion from the, when it first started, has really impacted what the project is going to be. I mean, on the issues that we've talked about, particularly in terms of lighting, changes that were made in terms of lighting, in terms of reducing the impact while still having adequate lighting, uh, issues that were made in terms of noise, in terms of the type of PA system that can be had and so forth. So rather than it just being thrown out there, just going out and buying the lights and putting in the PA system, there's been a very, very thorough process of, of looking at all this. And I think the other issue, and I, and I really believe this is going to happen just from the students that I'm seeing here tonight, is that the high school really needs to be responsible at all of these events and really, really take charge in terms of how these events affect the community, what's happening in terms of noise levels and parking and behavior and everything else. The high school can really, really play a very important part of this. I know that at Hoover High School that some of the students really started working on, on patrolling the streets and, 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 and checking with the neighbors and so forth because 
this is going to be an ongoing issue. It's not just it's going to be approved and the stadium is there and it's just what it is. It's going to be an ongoing refining in terms of the, the school and the community finding a way to, to continue to, uh, to work together on this. I think another example that was brought up about the compromise is by, by limiting to 18 uh, nighttime events, well, it doesn't 100% preclude an outside group using it. It, it almost does because the, there's enough going on at Point Loma High School to, to use those 18 uh, nighttime events, which are really an integral part of the community. So, so I just want to congratulate, even though people are going to have different feelings about the outcome, I, I really want to congratulate both sides for, for their input because I think it's resulted in a better project, a better product for everybody in the community. Okay. Um, for me, this issue has been something that we've been dealing with for many, many years. I've met with lots of different points of view in the community. Um, I have a lot of friends that live in the neighborhood. Um, and I, I think for me, I also think back to the beginning of the Hoover High School situation where we as a board discussed, you know, what kinds of things can we do to try to be a good neighbor so that one, on one hand we're providing for a quality school in every neighborhood and on the other hand we're being mindful of the neighbors and the impacts and although the operational expectations for field usage are not specifically in the EIR I think that those um, operational expectations for the field usage not just the 18 event limit, but also other things, um, have had a profound impact at the Hoover High School situation because the community is realizing that it is not every single night, it's not every week, um, it's only occasionally. And that's one of the things that actually um, has come out of the process in Point Loma over the last uh, three years is the idea that we are going to stick to um, this operational field expectation. And I understand there's some people in the community that they're uh, not certain or suspect uh, whether or not the board is going to stick to it. But I, can, uh, I cannot fathom a day when that, does, when, that, when that occurs. Because, you know, when you think about, we've heard from the principal, I believe, last year at Point Loma, that there is so, such high need for the facility that we don't envision a time where any outside group will be able to come in and use it for um, large events and things like that. I do know that um, the football team at Hoover High School goes out Saturday morning and cleans up the mess in the neighborhood that may exist. They take ownership and responsibility to be good neighbors just in the event that there are uh, lasting effects of the event from the night before. I do know that um, there are already plans in place to try to help use the parking spaces at the neighboring schools and have shuttle buses to carry people over to the event. These are things that we've talked about before and I'm sure and certain that they'll help to make um, when we do have events at the school much more successful. So the reason why I'm going to support it is because I believe that this is a good compromise. There's been a lot of work done by Lee Dolgoroff and the team, uh, a lot of uh, work and thought has gone into figuring out how do we get not your typical stadium lights but specialized stadium lights that damper the effect on the neighborhood and outlying areas. That There's been a lot of thought into the field use policy to limit the number of times that this is an impact on the community. Um, so for these reasons I'm going to support um, the initiative and adopt the EIR tonight. If you would focus on the screen, uh, there are uh, five bullets, and I, and I want to um, I'll call attention to the first two, go to the second two, and then move to, uh, to, the, to the final bullet. The, um, it appears, and it is reality, that this board has reviewed the final EIR and has been well presented, uh, and we've been uh, getting updates up until just moments before for the board. Listening to the concerns and the comments, identifying the issues, reviewing the issues and the comments, responding to those, uh, taking a look at mitigations, taking a look at adjustments, taking a look at what we can do in order to meet the needs of these uh, uh, 
uh, disparate uh, issues and concerns and groups. So they're really, these are really uh, concerns that are, that are deep, that are emotional, and that are, are important. But, and that's why we have the, the EIR process. So it's a very high level, very stringent uh, CEQA practice in order to take an issue, a concern like this, to the community to make sure that we have addressed all of the critical issues. And in this process, uh, we have uh, arrived at a final EIR in which the board has reviewed and the community has, has been able to participate. In addition, um, it is clear that we have complied with the guidelines. Uh, and, and we then want to move on to a couple areas that I, I have uh, you know, a few questions about. So as we, as we look at this process, we took a look, we examined areas of concern, we took a look at mitigations, we took a look at adjustments, we attempted to identify uh, the benefits and the harm and, and in an effort to try and reduce the harm, maximize the benefit and arrive at a conclusion. In an effort to do that, there are mitigating, monitoring, and reporting programs. And when you can elaborate a little bit on that. What, what do we do with these areas that were concerns and, and that we need to deal with? I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce Ed Grudsmacher from the law firm of Myers, Nave, Ryback, Silver, and Wilson, um, located in the Bay Area and offices throughout the state. Um, they are a very well-known CEQA firm that focuses on representing public agencies through the um, project approval and CEQA litigation. Thanks, Kimberly. Welcome. Mr. President, um, the mitigation monitoring and reporting program is one of the required uh, approvals that you're going to be making tonight. And what it does is it basically sets out um, the mitigation measures that are in the EIR that the district has decided to place on this project and also um, details how and when those mitigation measures are going to be implemented and uh, who within the district has a responsibility for implementing those, those mitigation measures. So it's, it's essentially a checklist document um, that shows both uh, the board and the public, um, this is what we're gonna do and this is how we're going to do it. Okay. And do you feel the mitigation monitoring reporting program is adequate for addressing the concerns? Yes. Okay. So, where we can't mitigate and monitor, then we arrive at a point of finding effects and a need for a, a statement of overriding conditions. Can you summarize what that means and, and what does that mean for the board and the community involved? Sure, those are actually two separate uh, parts of the approval. The findings of fact are actual findings of fact regarding the project itself. Um, the statement of overriding considerations is something that CEQA requires where a project has significant and unavoidable impacts. That means impacts that cannot be mitigated to a less than significant level. Um, when uh, uh, the board or any other public agency wants to adopt a project that has significant and unavoidable impacts, it also needs to adopt what's called a statement of overriding considerations and what that statement does and what the statement um, attached to the draft resolution in your board packet states is that um, the benefits of the project outweigh the environmental impacts of the project. Um, what those benefits are is a matter of discretion and the board staff has uh, proposed some of the statement uh, of the benefits of the project within that statement of overriding considerations. Uh, but that is something that the board can add to uh, or modify as they see fit um, before finally adopting. And the two critical issues are noise and traffic. Can you elaborate? That, that's correct. The two um, impacts that were unable to be mitigated to a less than significant level deal with, with the noise impacts from the project and the traffic impacts from the project. Any further questions? So it's absolutely critical that as we move forward that we acknowledge the concerns and, and, and the real heartfelt needs of, of, our, of our students, of our academic program, of our athletic program, and the needs of our community. We wanna have quality schools in every neighborhood, and we know that requires having a quality neighborhood around every school. We know that we wanna to work together and to deal with the tough issues. 
Uh, this has been a, a lesson in civility. It's been an opportunity to identify critical issues and to deal with those issues in a meaningful and a legal, in, 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 in a legal manner. Um, so I want to thank the community. I want to thank uh, the students and the people here tonight and the folks who have worked on this issue over the uh, was it 50 years that we had. A f uh, so for the uh, uh, for the three years that, that I'm aware of uh, when I first came on this board, the, the first question I had, the first call I had, was about Point Loma and this and this issue. And I've been dealing with the issue ever since. And and, I, and I'm pleased that we can arrive at this moment where we can make the decision. But I think with the decision that we make. It is, we're not concluded. Uh, this is not a single event. This is a process of learning to work together, learning to grow together. I think the field use issue that was brought up is important to this and that we want to make sure that the decision made allows us to put students first, to put the educational program of children first, as well as to incorporate the needs of our community and, 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 and our neighbors. Uh, with that, um, the last point has to do with the approval, and uh, we do have a uh, we do have a motion on the floor, and we do have a second. If there is no other discussion or comments, cast your vote. Trustee <laughs> Beiser, you had a. Uh, uh, an action you want us to take? Yeah, first of all, I, I would like to uh, make a motion that we uh, amend our administrative procedure 9229 to allow for two weeks' notice uh, to the community uh, for any change that the board would consider in the uh, field use policy. Second. Uh, may I just interject quickly? Yeah, um, sure. You may want to just direct staff to um, prepare an amendment to AP 9229 for board's future consideration? Yes. Oh, right, so, so specific so reference. Yes. Right, right. Second, as amended. So done. Any further discussion? No. All right, cast your ballot. Push your button. Uh, so directed. Moving on to H2. Uh, food services. Move we approval. All right. And do we have speakers? Yes, we have one speaker. We have a speaker on H2. Uh, Citizen, are you still here? She's at the very back, so you want me to okay. perfect there? Okay. And then there's two others. For H2? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we have three speakers. Yes. Yeah. So, oh. I can't see if she stood up. Oh, staff will present. Do you want to start? Oh, yeah, I can start. So, uh, we do have a staff report on H2, and that will be followed by uh, public uh, speakers. So, Superintendent Martin? Yes, there is. Yes, we have three. Thank you, President Macquarie. This item is about our food services proposed meal price increase for the 2016-17 school year. I just want to make sure that it's clear that this is the first price increase that we've had as a district since 2008. Make sure that you also understand that it, this increase only affects our paying students, not our students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. They are not impacted by this proposed change. Um, also, to be clear, the USDA requires that paid lunch prices must keep paid with the free and reduced lunch prices because we don't they that it's called paid lunch equity not wanting we want to make sure that the free and reduced reimbursements are not subsidizing the paid meals so when we start inching over to the paid meals being subsidized by the non-paid meals we need to adjust the prices so um, at, for that reason and a potential working with our food services administrative review there may be some findings related to this as well so we want to be proactive in making sure our food uh, lunch prices are consistent and we're able to follow the guidelines required. And Gary Patel is here to offer any further questions or details if you'd like to ask. Okay, so let's have citizen for, or, uh, yeah, no, Gary has staff first. Gary Patel? Well, questions. Gary, if I don't have, know if you had anything you, you wanted to add to that. Anything you want to add, Gary, then we'll have uh, our speaker. Good evening. 
You said it perfectly, Superintendent. Uh, good response. All right, excellent. Okay, citizen, thank you. Thank you for uh, letting, us, letting us wrap that up. Increasing the price of school lunches got a great spin from the $2 million PR department that Cindy Martin has. The excuse that kids have to pay more is that increased labor costs and food costs have to be covered? I don't think that's true. Here's what the public is not told. Andrew Donovan signed an agreement to pay back school lunch money of $1.8 million, which includes $88,800 in interest just for the first year, and that's going to be for several years, to repay the state of California for mismanagement of school lunch money. Half a million dollars of school lunch money spent on movie tickets and seized candy for employee awards that was illegal and never paid back. The district claims that taxpayers are subsidizing students who can afford to pay for lunch. Well, that threshold for free and reduced lunch is very low. And there are a lot of people that are still struggling right now. And that increase in lunch money, it's a big impact on a family that has two, three, four kids. The district claims that, but this is the same bunch of people who let Marnie Foster get a free ride for meals for her family and then reveals it does a very sloppy job of verifying incomes. So who in fact was subsidizing? So the district has been giving away meals that should have been paid for and now it claims it's the fault of the kids and the kids will have to pay more for lunch money. $45 more from kids. From a district that has failed to provide school supplies for children. And they're paying far more than that for the school supplies. Look at my complaints and look how many times the California Department of Education has found that, yeah, it's true. Kids are paying for things in this school district they shouldn't be. Um, schools are taking, uh, charging students $5 for an ID card that costs them 25 cents to make. $25 for parking permits, but just from kids, not the adults. Just the kids pay the 25 bucks. And I mean, it just goes on and on, the many different things that they do. And now kids will have to pay for mistakes made by food services. Find the money someplace else. Don't raise the money for Thank their you. school lunches. So we have Ethel Larkins and Tamika Cook. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ethel Larkins, a former employee of the district, newly retired, also a former food service worker for 20 years, Hoover High School. And I'm coming to you as a grandparent that has a child in San Diego Unified School District. Okay. Uh, and as of CSCA past president, we are in support of the rate increase for the meals. As you said before, it's not going to affect the reduced, free and reduced lunches. Um, I've been with the district or was with the district for 20 years and in that 20 years, the meal prices only went up once, okay? And I think that was eight or nine years ago. So not only do I personally as a parent, as a grandparent, am in favor of this, I wanna make sure that my grandchild has healthy, nutritious fruit and vegetables as she enters into this school district and has breakfast and lunch there, so. On those three bases alone, I am in supportive of uh, the district increasing the meal. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've Thank you, actually Ethel. never left. Right. Okay, great. Tamika, please. My name is Timika oh, M. Cook, and I am an employee of Seneca Unified School District. First, I am a parent of a Seneca Unified School District student and an aunt of a student. And I, I provide the, foods, the, the food meals every single day at Crawford High School. And 25 cents is not a lot, because we, we give kids $5 to go to McDonald's, $10 to go to McDonald's. Sometimes they go spend $15 to go to the donut shop. I know because I'm a parent and my child hits me up every morning to go $15 to go to the donut shop. So with that being said, 25 cents is not a lot. And it's only 41% of the students that will be paying. My son pays for, for lunch. I don't mind giving him that extra 25 cent for lunch because it's only 25 cent. I can see if it was an increase of $5, but it's not. It's only 25 cent. It's not gonna hurt me, it's not gonna break me. Please um, vote yes on approving the 25 cent increase. Thank you, Timika. Um, is there a motion? Oh, okay. 
Do you have a comment, support? Just on that, it looks like our meals are cheaper than anybody else's. <laughs> yes. Um, a lot more than the donut shop. A lot cheaper yeah, than the donut shop. I mean, yeah, according to the chart. <laughs> so. Dr. Whitehurst Payne is referring to the board item where we've listed um, San Diego Unified's um, cost for meals compared to Santee, Alpine, Bonzel, and Carlsbad. Well, it's actually several districts and the average paid meal price and then ours. So she's just making comments about what was in the board item. We are the lowest in the county. And to be honest with you, I've had held the USDA off for the last seven years because I'm sensitive to people paying more money for, food, for their food. But this is mandated by the USDA that we do this. There isn't really a choice. It isn't about us making more money, um, even though we provide great food and we support our local farmers, our ranchers, and our producers. So, any other questions? Thank you, Gary. Okay. We have no more questions. We have a vote. We have a motion. Let's do it. Unanimous. H3. We'll now have a staff presentation on item H3, update on the impact of the governor's May revision to the 2016-17 district. Superintendent Martin, please present the item. Thank you, President Macquarie. Actually, um, President Macquarie and Trustee Whitehurst Payne have a little preview of this because we spent time in Sacramento talking that's, about the governor's budget proposal. So you have some um, early information. Uh, so Ms. Alkel, our CFO, and I will be presenting. I'll be presenting the state level view of what the governor's may revise holds in store for us. And then Ms. Alkeld will show um, what the impact to the district will be based on this on this revision. So there's some major points that in, in the on May 13th, the governor presented his, his revise, and it's an update of the revenue estimates. It's a, there's a new proposal con, from January that includes something to address the teacher shortage, and there's an increased um, focus on maintaining significant reserves. The governor continued to reiterate that. As the process in the May revise goes forward, and there's conversations up in Sacramento, there's four major points that are gonna be negotiated between now and the final budget adoption. First of all, there's a big conversation up at the state level around funding more preschools and child care slots and increasing the reimbursement rate. Second of all, whether or not we're going to increase funding for after school reimbursement fees is still being discussed. Whether or not to allocate money for teacher shortages and some proposals about how to do that. And the Senate has introduced since the revise a $200 million K-12 college readiness proposal. So as we look at going forward what the governor's proposal um, holds is we see in the May revision is that the LCFF will be 95.7% implemented in 2016-17. Our advocacy all along up in Sacramento has been to increase, to speed up the implementation of LCFF. We don't want to wait for full implementation. We want to see it as soon as possible. And we're seeing that, that payoff, that we are close to full implementation. And of note in this particular um, proposal, the LAO's revenue projections were for the first time ever very similar to the governor's projection. They were only off by $305 million. And in the past, the difference between the governor's proposal and the LAO was between one and $2 billion. So that's interesting. It's something different this year. Um, the De Department of Finance projections assume that Prop 30 is going to be allowed to expire, that there'll be a very low COLA for the next few years, and that there's gonna be much lower growth in Prop 98 over the next few Didn't years. we learn the COLA is zero? Yes, you're getting ahead of me. That's the next slide. Um, the governor did very much in his in his comments talk talk about now is the time to start preparing for slower growth. There was a lot of caution, and so in this particular proposal, this slide here shows the difference between the January budget proposal and the May revision. And what you can see is from January to May, LCFF gap funding went from 49.8 percent, which is 2.8 billion dollars, to 54.84 percent, 2.9 billion dollars. And that change, 2.9 billion or the 54.84% brings us to the 95.7% in full LCF fund, LCFF funding. This additional, the change from January to May was an additional $154 million more than the January budget. So of course we'd like to see that increase. That's in line with our continued advocacy, advocacy is to speed up the implementation of LCFF. You'll also see the change the governor made in the one-time discretionary funds. 
His January proposal said that there would be $1.2 billion in block grant. He increased that to $1.4 billion, and, he, and that would be $214 per ADA, increased to $237 per ADA. We heard in Sacramento a caution around don't count your chickens before they hatch on that block grant, that there, because there is conversations um, in the Senate and the Assembly about other ways to spend that block grant money, there might be some chipping away of that. And we tried to read the tea leaves on what that might be. So we might end up being back to the $214 by the time everything's approved by the governor at final budget adoption. But for right now, we saw the one-time discretionary funds make, make a slight increase of additional $134.8 million from January to May. And we'll just have to watch that carefully and monitor. And of course, when we were advocating, we were saying, don't chip away at that, keep that where it is. Right. And we're fine, but there are folks that are advocating for some of those one-time dollars to be used for some special um, projects and programs that folks are interested in. This next slide sh shows us the Prop 98 funding history from 2007 up to currently. And at Prop 98, as we know, is significantly affected by the increases and decreases in state revenues. So as we see state revenues fluctuating each year, going up, going down, Prop 98 fluctuates. So in 14, 15, um, Prop 98 was an additional, four, an additional $463 million. Then in 15, 16, it decreased by 125 million. In 16, 17, it increased by 288 million. So when you see that go up and down, then you see the impact on this slide of what it means to our budget. And you can see that this pr current proposal funds the Prop 98 minimum guarantee at 71.9 million. But it really wasn't until 14, 15 that we saw the Prop 98 guarantee go up. We like that and we want to maintain that, but you can see it's only going up very incrementally now. It's not like a big a big jump like we saw from 13, 14 to 14, 15, but we're pleased to see that from the January proposal to, to um, the May revise that we increased it slightly and for 16, 17, we're going to see a $71.9 million um, Prop 98 proposal or funding of Prop 98 at 71.9 million. The challenges that the governor discussed in the, in the state budget, he kept um, signaling that the economic slowdown is around the corner. He cautioned us about the May revise being something that's going to warn of a current economic expansion. He wants to be careful to exceed caution. He talked about there being slow to no growth in the income tax and the sales tax, which together were going to account for the 90% of the general fund revenues and slowing the LCFF significantly as Prop 30 revenue revenues start to fade, we're going to see that possibly fade. So this, the May revision, it's important to note, is based on the assumption that there will be no new revenues on the horizon and that the extension of Prop 30 would simply allow the state to eliminate a deficit spending but will not provide new monies for new programs. And we want to, the governor was clear that if Prop 30, the projections don't assume that it passes. If it does pass, it's not new revenue. It's so that there won't be a cut. When you say it passes, you're talking about the Prop 30 proposed extension? Yes. That's on the November ballot? Yes. Okay. And, and the, May's, uh, the May revise assumed that it, it didn't take that into consideration because it hadn't been passed. So right, yeah, you that. don't want to count it until um, He also passed. talked about that if a, re if a recession occurs prop thir and Prop 30 is not extended, that possibly the state revenues could drop below prior year levels and then cuts could ed to education could be on the horizon. The next slide talks about specifically Prop 30 if it was approved by vote that was approved by voters in 2012. We know it established the temporary tax rate increase, and there's we know that there were efforts to extend the high bracketed income tax rate. If approved, that would continue, but according to current projections, the governor insists that there'll be no extra money to spend. So just want to put the Prop 30 context into the conversation that's happening out there. We're not making our projections based on that because we cannot. There's also a significant conversation in the early education block grant that was part of this proposal, and the governor has great interest in allowing local districts to decide how best to approach early education and to say, here's the money, you all decide what's the best way to educate your youngest your youngest students. And so the proposal contemplates this idea of transitioning out of, of uh, no longer having tra uh, transitional kindergarten by July of 2017. Doesn't mean you can't have it. You can do it um, locally using the block grant if that's what you decide to do as a local priority. If we decide that our continuum of services for elementary or for early education 
includes a, a portion of t uh, transitional kindergarten, we could do that, but we would use the block grant to do it. They're, they're not trying to say that they have said that it would end, but it's not going to be written into the expectation as it currently is now and, and currently now funded on a per ADA. They wouldn't be a per ADA, it would be, here's the block grant, you decide locally how you wanna do it. If the if the block grant proposal, right now that blo the early education block grant proposal has been rejected by the assembly and by the Senate, so we're not, no, we don't know yet how it's gonna end up, but there has been a rejection. If it were to pass as written, um, it would require districts to develop a three-year community early learning plan, which is consistent with what we would like to do. We like the idea that it would be local, but there would, that would be a requirement. The change that we saw from the January early education block grant to the May revise is they added $20 million from Prop 98 general fund to give money to the county to provide oversight to districts to implement the uh, the early education block grants. So the difference between the January proposal and the May is is another $10 million of ongoing money and $10 million of one-time money, $20 million in, in, in total to add an additional governance structure for local districts to have the county help provide guidance, support, governance, and oversight of implementing. So we saw another $20 million come out of um, the general fund. So bureaucracy. So, yeah, I'm going to continue. I'll, I'll say it. And so the teacher work. For, the other thing that was we saw a lot of conversation about um, is in the proposal is there's a significant interest up in Sacramento to figure out what we're going to do about teacher shortage and the teacher workforce actions. We saw some um, funds being allocated or suggestion about wh whether or not we would allocate at the state level money to address the teacher shortage initiatives. There's all kinds of ideas floating right now. One of the funding ideas is to invest in teacher residencies. A second one is to pay for classified employees, to pr put classified employee incentives for our classified employees to become teachers. Another proposal the governor put in there was creating a four-year integrated degree program. So all of these are being discussed and these actions, we'll have to see um, what actually ends up coming out. But the May Revise proposed the one-time investment to, uh, to accelerate the process, to have it be a four-year degree and that, that might, a one-time investment of general funds might help infuse increasing teacher workforce actions. That would be implemented in this proposal with competitive grants of up to $250,000. Um, turns into a total of 10 million that he's putting in the proposal would be administered by the Commission on Teacher Credentialing and the post-secondary institutions. The money would go to the post-secondary institutions and it would preference the situations or institutions that already have something like that in place. So all of those are things that we'll keep monitoring what happens with the block grant, what happens with the teacher workforce actions and seeing if any of that 1.4 billion gets chipped away in some of the negotiations that are going to happen currently. So all in all, the, the, it, the, uh, the theme up in Sacramento when we were there last week is it wasn't a very exciting budget year for education. Not a lot happened in the positive or in the negative. It was somewhat status quo, but we did see the unreimbursed mandates that we advocated for is continuing. We're seeing the continued speeding up of LCFF implementation, but to caution that if we're at 90, almost over 95% implementation, we're almost finished. And so we're gonna see the, the continuing increase each year kind of level out once we're fully funded at LCFF. And then you start getting into the conversation about adequacy and saying, okay, it's fully funded and we still, we've already decided and, and publicized as a district what our gap funding, what our gap would be to be adequately funded or robustly funded to deliver to our students. So at this point, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Salkeld who will talk about the impact to the district. Um, now that we know what the governor's proposed in this revise, what does that mean in terms of our um, revenue projections and what has changed since January based on this new information? Thank you, Superintendent Martin. Uh, this next slide here, just to echo some of the points that Superintendent Martin mentioned, um, certainly from an educational standpoint, you know, the governor has been committed to education. Uh, remained similarly the same as we were back in January. Again, it's been year over year commitment, uh, but it was a slight increase to $71.9 billion from the $71.6 billion that we had in January. So it was a slight increase, so at least it's, it's the, that commitment. But as Superintendent Martin mentioned, a lot of these are quotes from his press conference on the 13th, was just really, again, that theme of just be cautious with the future, um, where is Prop 30 going to be come November, and where those revenues. Um, from a state level at, at that high 
high level, there was about a $2 billion decrease in revenues that they had anticipated um, working with the Department of Finance, and so they actually offset that to the contribution to the rainy day fund. So he's just cautious, cautioning knowing that there's a little bit of a slight change with revenue. Um, what it means to the district, this slide here is kind of that bottom line impact and kind of looking at it, there's two key components coming out of, of, the, rev, of the governor's uh, May revise. It's that one-time discretionary dollars, as Superintendent Martin mentioned, and then the ongoing commitment to LCFF. We have to look at it from a two-year perspective because for 15-16, that's what the one-time comes into play of, of kind of where we're budgets were anticipated at and where the Department of Finance is saying. So there is an increase. So if right now where we're looking at, we're looking about a $3 million increase to those numbers. Again, extreme caution to the board because of what we heard last week in Sacramento is the, the assembly and the Senate, you know, are coming up with their own proposals. Um, things could certainly change come June 15th when the governor then looks and reviews at that information as they now reconcile those differences over the next few weeks and then until the governor actually signs the budget in late after the 15th of June. Um, so that's one area here just from, just from a cautionary standpoint. But the data that's on this particular slide is what is the latest information that we have available to prepare our budget, which we'll be bringing to the board in our first reading on June 14th. So we have to take the latest data from the Department of Finance and what's available. But again, it's just kind of that caution. Um, the other thing, another point or another data set is we've shared historically, we've always, and I always reference a point of, in time, what we've noted on here for 1516 is we now have our latest attendance information, which we free, refer to as P2, which is that there's three different reporting periods, P1, which is around December, P2, which is in March, and then we do a final adjustment in July when it's certified for enrollment. So now that we have that latest information, we're able to update our, our revenue model, and there was a slight ADAD decrease uh, for 15, 16, so that's why it's reflected on here, a little over a million dollars. Um, so now taking that information for 16, 17, um, again, that gap funding that was mentioned earlier, as Superintendent Martin mentioned, again, there's that commitment, um, again, from the, from the governor. So there is a slight increase of over three million in that regard. But again, when you look at all these different variables, the cost of living adjustment was reduced to zero. Dr. McQuarrie mentioned that earlier. It's zero, and we asked those questions again to the Department of Finance last week, and that's aligning to the federal numbers and calculations they get, because um, we certainly did stress that, because that's about a $2 million loss for the district. Um, so we did indicate that. And that's the first time in anybody's recent memory that the COLA was zero, was 0.47, and for it to go to zero was mm -hmm. not what we had anticipated Yeah, we didn't anticipate. All. I mean, that slight difference of just 0.47 is significant for us. Um, and then again, just looking at ADA for 16, 17 specifically, again, when we get P2 data, allows us another opportunity to reassess our estimates. Um, again, this is, it does have an increase because we're also looking at attendance percentages. That's about 95%. So when we start, these are the points in time throughout the year that we can start evaluating. So again, this is just where we're giving you a preview as we continue our work into the next few weeks um, in terms of revenue. And the next slide here is just to highlight, again, what and echoing what we heard last week. When you look at the 1617, the, the blue um, bar graph there, and when you look at it in comparison to where LCFF is supposed to be at at 2021 at full implementation, this is where the governor is saying things are gonna be flattening now because we're at now a little over 95% fully implemented. Could that kind of taper off? And we just need to monitor that as it um, works out with Prop 30. Again, in the fall, will be key to see how Prop 30 comes into play, what the Department of Finance will do. Um, we did hear from the Legislative Analyst Office. They had a little bit of a different perspective. They believe it might increase Prop 98. So again, it's just trying to get a sense of where all those variables fall out into the fall. We'll have to see where that, and that most importantly will fall into January's governor's proposal at that point for the next year. Um, this is just a table that we've shared with the board historically as well. It's just to highlight that now with those gap funding percentages as we look for 16, 17, and we look to full target of LCFF, there's about almost $40 million that in essence is due to fully implement that for, from the district standpoint in terms of revenues. Um, again, this is just another slide to show that COLA is zero, and we did add that historical perspective that you can see that we haven't been at zero <laughs> in the last few years, so this, is, this was unexpected, that slight change. 
Um, another point here, just again, it's part of our budget planning as we're working ahead for the next few weeks. I know Dr. Whitehurst Payne was, was asking um, there in Sacramento last week too about any developments with the CalSTRS, CalPERS rates, and it is statutory law. I mean, that is what was came about of the governor's uh, budget a few years ago. PERS is obviously independent, but they continue to assess those rates. Those are escalating. Um, what we're anticipating for 16, 17 alone is about a $15 million increase in the, in the subsequent year, 17, 18, about 20 so it's one of those things that does compete with LCFF dollars and we're monitoring that closely um, and certainly keeping that attention within Sacramento um, the next slide here is just to point out again as I mentioned our work ahead of us multi-year projections are the best information or rely, rely on the best information that we have available so we're using May revise going forward um, in terms of us looking at um, you know, going moving forward, projections could change um, if we hear any other information um, over the next few months and certainly into the fall and then into next January for the 17, 18 years, as an example. Um, but one key takeaway is just, you know, sustainability is going to be key. Um, one time dollars, as we've been saying, just kind of caution there just because of what we're hearing that that the state they're chipping away those dollars um, and, and what that will fall out with and again could there be any economic variables we need to consider um, and then just those retirement obligations that I mentioned earlier and then here I'll transition to Superintendent Martin because framing that from a funding adequacy standpoint. I know I sort of previewed it a minute ago I, I went ahead of myself when I said funding adequacy we're going to continue to have our conversation on advocacy about funding adequacy as we worked with other districts, um, the, the, or the Urban School Coalition and other districts that are filling out the template to be able to make sure that we're continuing to advocate from the, uh, from the point of view that the state of California continues to rank in the bottom 10%, that investments are continued to be needed and that these promising pilots that we know are working in order to take them to scale, we're gonna be very clear on what we need, why we need it, what data will go with those programs and how we're going to take the investments that we've made we're calling them the down payments on our future and saying when we already know what works to close the achievement gap and we already have examples of the achievement gap being closed for some kids some days in some schools that could be all kids in all schools every day with proper investment and, and we don't wait until there's proper investment to deliver we deliver with the dollars that we have we don't we don't ever use it as an excuse but we want to continue to have that conversation that being 46th in the nation or maybe inching up a little bit above that as new project new um, numbers come in is not acceptable and so we'll continue to talk about our investment gap in 14 15 terms was 350 million dollars which is about three thousand two hundred dollars per student that even even if that was the investment in 14, 15, that wouldn't have even put us, at, that would have just gotten us to average. So we will continue to have that conversation and we'll have the conversation based on what we know works on behalf of our students and, and talking about the successful programs and pilots that we make promises to in our LCAP that we could, we could do more. We're gonna do the best that we can with those dollars that we have currently and funding adequacy continues to be an important part of the conversation um, that we can't ignore that while we um, make decisions with the dollars that we get. And this last slide here is just kind of the, a preview of what's ahead over the next few weeks. So obviously we're sharing you the, uh, with you the update today of, of what the governor noted in the May revise. There's a lot of work in Sacramento um, until we see what comes about in the next few weeks. Uh, but we'll be presenting to the board on the 14th, um, also with our LCAP, because we will be spending the um, majority of the day previewing those components of the LCAP and then bring to you the first reading of the budget. Um, and then there's, all, there's an EPA as part of the Prop 30, there's that requirement that'll be coming forth as well and then on the 28th will be our second reading and we'll also be bringing to you our tax uh, revenue anticipation notes or trans uh, for our short-term borrowing so from a cash position and, and that uh, perspective we'll be bringing that resolution to you for action on the 28th um, so that we can remit it back to the send it to the county office for their review uh, by the 30th well, excellent Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. There's your update. We have it's our first time doing it without Martha. We have a uh, citizen. Uh, <coughs> thank you. No citizen could look at this document that's presented, 20 PowerPoints and, and, and graphs, and understand the district budget. I still don't understand, has the superintendent presented a balanced budget? Where's the $50 million hole? 
Why is there a $50 million hole? I heard discussion about investment gap and take to a scale when you're just saying that the governor said you better plan for a recession, you better scale back, and we're still talking about a $350 million investment gap. This was not a very good presentation about where we are at the budget. I still don't understand where we are at the budget. I heard what the governor said. Everybody heard it. There was a big press conference about it. And everybody looked at his charts and he was pointing at it. But what are you guys doing with that information? Do we still have a $50 million gap or don't we? And what are you doing to solve it? Because I'm looking at another H4 and you're going to reduce some vacant job positions but you don't have any people in that job, so you're not paying anybody, and you're calling that an ongoing budget solution? What is that? This is a really poor presentation for the type of a budget this school district is handling. And the attachments are terrible, absolutely terrible. No one coming to this meeting would understand what, what the budget situation is for this school district. It's really poor. Thank you. So this is an information item. There's no action to be taken. Any we'll move additional? H4. Okay. H4 then moved. Is there a second? Oh, let's see. H4. And we have. Uh, we, let's see. Well, hold, and we have a comment. We have a uh, new. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, Martin, do you have a? Want to present the item? Okay. Okay. Uh, so for H4. Um, let's see, so we have Ethel Larkin and Timika, if I got it right. Did I, did I get it right? It's Tamika. Timika. The lunch lady, Tamika. Oh, all right, I'm working on it. I got, yeah. I got several more options to try. Okay. <laughs> I, I, before when I came up, I didn't say good evening to you, Mr. President McCurry, and oh. the trustees and to Superintendent Martin. Uh, Martine. Anyway, right. uh, my question, I just had a question on, on this one. Um, it's uh, classified, you're eliminating vacancies and or, so I just wanted to know, I know there's vacancies and, and if I remember correctly, the money still has to be set aside for those vacancies in those positions. So what's gonna be happening to the money that when you eliminate these vacancies in these positions? That was my question. All right, thank you. Again, the name is T Mika. I, I, I you see. can just call me the lunch lady. T Mika. And I'm here on behalf of CSEA. I'm the vice president of food service. So anything that has to do with eliminated positions on in my department goes against all my all my being. Whether it was vacant, it should have been filled a long time ago. That is a benefited position, and for us to get a four-hour position in food service, that is hard. So it's to eliminate a four-hour position and not give us an opportunity to, to fill it is a shame. Please believe, un unlike me, there's people who's been in the district for 20 years who's still at two hours. I have a lady who's in her 70s. She's still working three and a half hours. She's never been benefited, so she can't retire because she has no benefit position. So if you would have gave her that position 10 years ago, she would have been able to retire five years ago. Don't eliminate any benefit positions in food service. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. So I see my, uh, so then uh, Citizen already spoke and uh, she referenced this in her earlier comment. So uh, with that, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Why are these still vacant? Thank you. Yeah. Tim, would you like to come and answer? Our Chief Human Resources Officer will address that question, okay. Mr. Beiser. So as we do site-based budgeting throughout the year, if you look at the vacancies that are coming up, we're, uh, we have some programs in the ECE program that are that we're eliminating next year because of low enrollment and we're consolidating classes. So those are vacant positions where we don't need staff. So there's no one in the position and no one to fill the position because there's not gonna be a class for those particular positions that were identified. 
How many of those positions that fit the description you just mentioned are on the docket tonight to be eliminated? How many? The, uh, I mean, I'd have to pull out my sheet, but it's about 11 positions. 11 positions. Okay. And then how many other positions are we being asked to eliminate? That's that it. Unfilled? Just those 11 and no food service positions are being eliminated through this process tonight. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Very moved. Comments? Uh, did we have a motion? We've got a motion. We don't do, we have, have a do we have a second? And a second. Uh, any other questions, concerns? Cast your vote. Okay. Um, let's uh, three one pass. Uh, we've done consent. No, we've got items pulled. So we have speakers on uh, item um, I-19. Did we want the comments on I-19 first? I'll move item I-19, 26 and 27. I'll second. Okay, I have no other speakers or uh, citizens not here. Any comments, questions? Cast your vote. Um, we then have... Um, we have uh, speakers, uh, public comments towards the end? You have some left over. No, he had to leave. Beginning. Oh, he's gone. Right, yeah. some left over. So, yeah. do you have your file? I've got right here. Okay, and then a couple, couple more. So, those left over at the front added the two new ones. Uh, is Mary Denherter here? Okay, uh, Lee Moore. Jack Lucero, uh, Mary Lou Finley, thank you, um, Wanda Reed Vandemeyer, uh, Zoe Lighty, Zoe, Zoe, all right, cool. um, okay, Zoe, thank you. Wow, well, you people have long nights. Um, I'm here to, as a member of CSEA, OTBS Chapter 788. I'm a high school registrar. I'm here to talk about respect. And I'll give you an example of the disrespect I just in, um, encountered on Friday. As a registrar, I've been a registrar for 18 and a half years. I've been in the district for almost 30. So I've worked my way up. I've seen the respect, I've seen the disrespect, and we go through cycles, but this has been the worst I've ever seen. Um, on Friday, I usually have, once a month, a peer-to-peer -peer meeting, which is an old title for what used to be the Java Likes, but we still have them because that's how we learn our positions, and that's how we stay consistent as a registrar for high schools. We try to stay on the same page, although we'll do something different, in our offices, we try to stay on the same page. Well, on that day, we were going through our round table talking about the issues that we've all encountered and how to solve them when two people were escorted into our room by the principal. I didn't know who they were, and they sat down, and we continued a couple more people, and I decided, no, I need to know who these people are. Well, it turns out she was an operations specialist and a program manager from the secondary office who decided to attend our meeting. And the operations specialist had just been hired. Now, we had no knowledge of this. We were not told, we were not warned, we were not even asked um, if they could attend our meeting. And you know, peer-to-peer -peer is just those classifications. It is not for anybody else unless they're invited. And I do invite people. I invite them uh, from IT because of all the issues we have with Power School, we do have them come. But this was unusual. Well, come to find out, 
I didn't know this, but my principal didn't know who they were either. And I informed her on Monday that this, these two people showed up. She said, well, they were here for the registrar's meeting. I said, well, they knew if they were here and they had been notified by me, they would have come right to straight to the library. Instead, they went to you. And all the way up to see us, they told her, oh, no, we're speakers. They were not invited to be speakers. They were not invited to our meeting at all. What I did find out later was that the operations specialist has been around to some of the registrars trying to find out what they do because she has no knowledge of what registrars do. She has no experience as a registrar whatsoever and now we're being asked to train her. She makes a heck of a lot more money than we do and we're asked to train her and that's what's going to have to happen. She's meeting with me next week. She met with a person before that person even knew that we had an operations specialist that was now over us. I'm just saying, respect goes both ways. And we didn't feel that on Friday. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Zoe. Scott Ellum here. Scott. Um, well, Aguirre, Aguilar, Genevieve. If I've said that right? Yes, that's right. Okay, uh, and Steve. Steve Lettenbeg. That does it. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Close that, baby. Good job. Good job, Mike. Good job, Cindy. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot different from the July 14 one. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Oh, ok